All right, I'm calling the City Council meeting of April 11, 2017 to order. Can the clerk call the roll? This is for the Palo Alto Public Improvement Corporation meeting. Oh, we do that first. I we forgot do that all first. about that. Oh now I actually have to get everyone. All right. Okay. Have a seat. Have to have everybody. I, I don't. I just got to tell people if they actually want to do it. Keeping us honest down there, Beth. Okay, I guess I'll call it to order. Do you have that piece of thing for that public improvement corporation thing? All right, that'd be helpful. I forgot all about that. All right, I'm calling the board of directors of the public, um, the Palo Alto Public Improvement Corporation to order. Um, can the clerk call the roll? Councilmember Du Bois, Councilmember Philseth, Councilmember Fine, Here. Councilmember Holman, Vice Mayor Niss, Here. Councilmember Ku, Here. Mayor Scharf, Here. Councilmember Tanaka, Councilmember Wolbach, Here. Five present, Six right. present, Seven present. Seven present. So we're just called the Board of Directors of the Palo Alto Public Improvement Corporation District to order. Do you have the sheet? I actually didn't bring it. Do you have the staff report? I don't know why it's not online. So the staff recommends that the Board of Directors of the Public Improvement Corporation approve the 2015-2016 financial statement for the Public Improvement Corporation. Um, I'll move that the Board of Directors Second. of the Public Improvement Corporation approve the attached 2015-16 PIC annual financial report. That's seconded by Vice Mayor Niss. Any discussion? Seeing none, if we could vote on the board. And that passes with um, Councilmember Du Bois and Councilmember Tanaka absent. Um, and now we move into the City Council meeting of April 11th, 2017. Can the clerk call the roll? Councilmember Du Bois, Councilmember Philseth, Councilmember Fine, Here. Councilmember Holman, Here. Vice Mayor Niss, Here. Councilmember Ku, Here. Mayor Sharp, Here. Councilmember Tanaka, <coughs> Councilmember Wolbach. Do you want a motion to go into closed session? Yeah, and now we have a closed session. We have two items, a conference of the city attorney on existing litigation, Ferrari versus the city of Palo Alto, and also a conference with real property negotiators of negotiators, um, California Government Code Section 54956.8 on the U.S. Post Office at 380 Hamilton Avenue. Um, can I have a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Okay. If we could vote on the board. And that passes with um, Council Members Du Bois and Tanaka absent. Um, it passes unanimously, uh, not unanimously, everyone else is in favor. Um, all right. It looks like Mayor Scharf is here, so I can't finish that great editorial. I'll leave you in suspense about... I know, right? Seeing no city manager, let's um, come back and do, um, well, we'll wait, he'll, he'll be out in a second. Mm -hmm. So what is this? This is oral communications. Okay. Is he coming soon? Did you see him? Why don't we just move to oral communications then, unless anyone has a concern. And our oral communications for items not on the agenda, our first speaker is Andy Reid, to be followed by um, Jenny Caratali. And you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Sharp and council members. 
My name is Andy Reed, and I live at 160 Melville, about 200 feet from Castilea School. I'm following up on a formal complaint that our group, Protect Neighborhood Quality of Life, filed with City Manager Keene, and we emailed it to all of you on March 25th. I will discuss two of these violations. Over-enrollment is one of many used violations that we documented in our complaint. It is especially important to our current issue with the school. Castilea has been out of compliance with their enrollment number of 415 since 2002. They bargained with the city to settle at a higher enrollment during 2013 on condition that they file for a new use permit, which, as you know, they have recently done, asking for an additional 30 percent in enrollment and simultaneously submitted major expansion plans. Planning Director Geidelman responded that she will investigate the other violations violations we described, but not the over-enrollment. The City Council has revisited fines for Edgewood, fees for developers. We ask that the City also revisit this issue that has festered for many years in our neighborhood, that the City could actually entertain putting the residents through five-plus years of staging and construction, including excavating for an underground garage, demolition of two old homes, and destroying canopies of old redwoods and oaks so that a single private school could increase their enrollment is appalling. The school makes public statements that they have met with the neighbors and included our input in these expansion plans, but that can be easily disputed. The city needs to interview us, the 24-7 residents, to hear our input, not what the applicant says is our input. Another violation of Castilea's Cup is the number of events that occur outside of typical school day. The Cup allows for five major functions each year, plus several other events during the year. Castilea is currently on track to have 100 events this year, taking place on weeknights and weekends, often consecutive. This results in cars coming in and out of the school driveways at late hours with the attendant noise and lights. We have compared other schools and residential neighborhoods agreements on events. Typically allowed is from zero to 15 per year. When we have spoken to our fellow Palo Alto citizens, they are eager to sign our petition and add their support to our cause. You have seen our line, lawn signs proliferating around town. We met with the City Council on February 6th and handed over our original petitions with 412 signatures. Today, please accept another 100 paper signatures. We are also happy to report 70 more people have signed online for a total of 582 <coughs> signatures on our petition asking for the City to enforce Castilea's conditional use permit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Caraltley, Jenny, to be followed by Rita Varel. I'm Jenny Karatli, and I represent the Barron Park Donkey Project. Um, I want to um, start by thanking you for the support that you voted uh, on December 12th of $10,000 to support the Donkey Project, and an additional $5,000 if the community was able to raise $10,000. I'm happy to say that we did that very quickly. Um, our, our year to date, sorry, um, Income is over is nearly seventeen thousand dollars from the community, and the year the uh, fiscal year is June sorry July through June. Um, we have raised nearly twelve thousand dollars since the council meeting on December twelfth, and most of that uh, we reached our goal of ten thousand dollars by February twenty second. So with the city council funds, we're doing quite well, and three more months to go. So a very brief report of the accomplishments. Um, we acquired a new donkey, Jenny. She's the larger one in the front. They're getting along quite well. They're together almost all the time. Um, we have done quite a bit of pasture maintenance and much of it with the engagement of Mr. Witt. We are very grateful for his support. Um, I'm particularly happy about the new watering devices that we put in just a few weeks ago. We have reorganized the handlers group, including a training program for handlers for walking and all over care. We've included a few new volunteers, and the donkeys have been walking quite a bit in the community, which is really fun. 
We have uh, the vet came and visited us for a donkey clinic to talk about um, health issues and we're hoping to schedule another one. Very recently, we've returned to um, Sundays in the Park, which is a tradition that goes back many years um, between 10 and 11 on Sunday mornings. The donkeys are there to visit with uh, families, whoever wants to come and see us. Please join us if you haven't. Um, we are working on um, a number of things, including the website revamping, and um, I've engaged with a group called Get Involved Palo Alto, which is a community service group for high schoolers. And we have great plans to um, work towards the community history and fundraising. We were um, recognized in the Metro uh, as part of the best of Silicon Valley for 2017 for celebrity sighting. And finally, I just want to thank you very much for ongoing support. Thank you. Rita Varel to be followed by Bob Moss. Good evening. It's hard to follow the donkeys, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, on um, March 8th at something like 12.05 in the morning, the City Council passed an ordinance allowing uh, accessory dwelling units on any sized lot in any neighborhood with minimal setbacks and no parking requirements. I think this is horrible. Traffic is the number one problem in Palo Alto. It's been identified over and over again. I think parking has a lot to do with traffic. You have um, residential parking permit programs. You have a waiting list for some of these. The dentists are upset. You discussed a large parking garage last week. You're gonna discuss a parking garage this week. And yet, you are going to be allowing um, junior and regular accessory um, dwelling units in any, on any size lot with no parking. That doesn't mean covered parking, it just means no parking required. Please tell me I am wrong. I hope that everyone will come to the city council meeting on 417 and speak out against this ordinance. I feel that with the comp plan, the city council did their best to gut it. I feel like you're basically now gutting our neighborhoods. You have no, to my knowledge, Airbnb uh, rules in place. These are supposed to be for families, um, individuals with um, disabilities. I think that they will turn into much more than that. If you cannot come to the meeting, please email the city council. Go to the website to get the address, city.council at cityofpaloalto.org. If you do not speak up now, the city will be changed forever. And if you don't act, don't complain. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Moss to be followed by C. Reddy. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sharp and council members. At the meeting last week where the garage was identified for the California Avenue location, actually in Sheridan and Birch and, and uh, Ash, there's some question about the aquifer and whether the garage going down two stories would interfere with the aquifer. So I dug out the data on that site and the answer is yes. The aquifer on that property is down th only 13 feet and the bottom of the garage would be 21 feet, so it will penetrate the aquifer. Now, it doesn't mean you can't build it, it just means that when the building is built, when the garage is built, you have to take care to seal the basement and put in barriers against water intrusion from the aquifer into the garage itself. And also, typically, it requires periodic surveys, maybe every six months, every year, just to make sure the garage isn't leaking. Uh, I pass out a, a copy of what the aquifer looks like so you have that for your records and you can see what I'm talking about. The other two issues are monitoring wells and the toxic plume. There is a monitoring well, F37A, on the property at Ash, uh, right near Sherman. And so when a garage is built, you have to take into account the fact that you have a well there and talk to the Regional Water Quality Control Board about how you're gonna protect that well or build around it and also allow monitoring on that well to continue. 
So that's another potential cost. So these additional potential costs should be factored in to the cost of the garage if you haven't already. Uh, the final issue is toxics. Is there a contamination from a toxic plume that originates at the research park, primarily 640 page mill on the site? And the answer is no. I gave you a copy of the toxic map and basically the contaminated water doesn't go much across Page Mill Road. So building a two level underground garage will not get you into a situation where you're uh, exposing people above ground to toxics from the contaminated groundwater. The groundwater there is at least clean in terms of TCE. So all of these issues should be considered when you get into detail and building a garage so the actual cost is realistic and the monitoring for things like water leakage from the aquifer are taken into account. Thank you. C ready to be followed by Mary Sylvester. Good evening, Mayor and the City Council and the citizens of Palo Alto. You know, last week, the state legislature passed $52 billion worth of uh, projects that will require us to pay 12 to 13 cents a gallon. We did not send Mark Berman and Jerry Hill to tax us more. It is a tax on a lot of people. Uh, regardless of how much wealth they have, the 12 cents is a lot of money for a long time. This is a road to nowhere. Again, another boom doggle for unions. So which of the city council members are supporting this, I'd like to know. But who is opposing it, it's more important for us. So this is absolutely unneeded, unnecessary, quickly rushed by uh, my beloved Jerry Brown. Uh, I totally oppose it. I think it is not good for our communities. Waste of money, again, going into places where it shouldn't be going, road to nowhere. Thank you. And the second item I want to talk about is the United Airlines fiasco. A doctor, a, a doctor raised in Vietnam, had a Chinese background. He looked Chinese, was forcibly removed of the four people that were picked and dragged like a snake out of the airplane, which is, should never have been done. It, it would have been thought out properly. How do you take, uh, they wanted to take four seats and send the crew to Louisville. Well, they can take corporate plane and send them to Louisville too. So I think they should remove the CEO right away. And I would like City of Palo Alto not to have any employees travel on United for a little while uh, until they remediate this. It is an absolute insult to uh, uh, a citizen, a honest man, regardless of what background he has. You know, this is, looks like another Rodney King event. You know, we should learn from it. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Sylvester to be followed by Stephanie Munoz. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and honorable council members. I'm Mary Sylvester. I live at 135 Melville Avenue. I'm a 39 year resident of that address. I live half a block from Castilea School. I am here on behalf of myself and a group of neighbors who live in the immediate vicinity of the school. On April 7th, these neighbors and myself requested from the Palo Alto Planning Department an extension on our scoping letter regarding Castilea's environmental impact report. The reason why we submitted this request for an extension is because Castilea is submitting its required documents two days after the public comment period. The comment period ends Saturday, April 15th. Castilea is submitting its documents April 17th. Therefore, we ask the planning department for two weeks to review those documents before we submitted our final scoping letter. 
We've incurred significant legal fees as well as con expert consultation on our scoping letter. And to deny our request for a reasonable period of time when Castilea may submit new documents that make our comments null and void, we believe constitutes an undue burden on our free speech uh, rights as well as violating CEQA guidelines. Therefore, we would like to ask the council to reconsider our request for a reasonable period of two weeks to review new documents submitted by the school. Thank you very much for your time, and I'd also like to thank the council for opening up your retreat last Friday and Saturday to the public. I found it fascinating, and I appreciate the transparency and the inclusion of the community. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephanie Munoz, our final speaker. Good evening, Mayor Sharp and council members. Well, I have the Heart and Home, or the remnants of the Heart and Home Homeless Women's Shelter again this year. I just couldn't stand it. It's cold out there, and it, it just seems so unreasonable that these are regular people. They came, they, do they went to school, they got degrees, they do jobs, they rented houses, and then the city of Palo Alto improved the value of all the properties in Palo Alto by putting a big complex of industrial and commercial in, which raised the, the value of everything. And, and, and these people were just simply pushed out of their homes. Well, however, and they're, they're, very, they're very sweet. It's driving me crazy. They keep buying me things. Some new placemats. Honey, I've got placemats. A new dishpan. Your old dishpan's kind of crud. Honey, I have a dish. I don't need a new dishpan, a new this, a new mop, a new broom. They're very big on cleaning. Anyway, the, the thing is, you know, like all of you, I, I'm on board with capitalism. I can live with the fact that I get to eat time from time to time. I turned over Rossini and Grand Marnier Souffle. And other people have to eat peanut butter sandwiches every day. I can live with that. But lately, I've had some kind of myalgia, and I can't sleep at night. I, I can't turn. I can't, I can't move. I can't rest. I can't get up. It, it's, it, and I'm sleepless, and then I'm sleepy in the daytime. And I have to tell you, you have to have provide a place for regular citizens to sleep, something. It, uh, like an exercise mat or, or something out of the rain and safe from predators. It's just not civilized to have people, women, especially women, wandering about <coughs> in and are unable to sleep. These people have jobs, by the way. And I'm, uh, I, I believe that uh, if necessary, you could put in a porta potty down in the downstairs garage any place that they could get out of the elements and just put their head down and go to sleep. Because having people with no place to sleep is not civilized. It's not, a, it's not your standard. I know you have better standards than that. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And now we return to the city manager for city manager comments. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Apologize for being out. A uh, couple of uh, updates. Uh, first of all, uh, a report on the VTA Next Network Initiative final plan. Uh, on Friday, last Friday, April 7th, VTA released its Next Network Initiative final plan, which uh, really deals with uh, bus transport in uh, Santa Clara County. And it does include major cuts to Route 88 uh, and a reduction in paratransit service for residents on the east side of Palo Alto along US 101. In a change from the draft plan released in January, Route 89 
would continue to run between the California Avenue Caltrain Station, College Terrace, and Stanford Research Park. City staff has identified an opportunity to partner with the VTA to replace the service along the Route 88 corridor by expanding the Palo Alto Free Shuttle Program, and we will have this concept for council discussion at your meeting next week on the 17th of April. Funding will be critical to make a new shuttle route possible, and our staff will be asking council members to urge your contacts on the VTA board to provide funding to operate this new route even before Measure B transit operations become available. We'll get you all some of the information for any conversations you can have between now and when the VTA board votes. That vote will take place on May 4th. An update on high-speed rail. On Wednesday, April 5th, our staff, along with uh, some of our uh, citizens, um, attended a public open house hosted by the California High-Speed Rail Authority in San Francisco. Uh, this was the first in a series of three meetings, which will be held over the next several weeks. These meetings are being held to provide an update on the San Francisco to San Jose segment of the high-speed rail project. Based on the materials presented at the meeting, the authority does not appear to be moving towards an option with passing tracks in Palo Alto. They do seem to be moving towards a short four-track section in South San Mateo, Belmont, and San Carlos. According to the authority, this option provides less operational flexibility but minimizes potential impacts to residential land uses. So, if that holds, I mean, for us, a good update. The current project schedule shows the presentation of a preferred alternative to the California High-Speed Rail Authority Board of Directors in the summer of 2017. According to the presentation, all at-grade crossings will be upgraded with quad gates, vehicle intrusion detection, and median barriers. At this time, only existing at-grade crossings within the multi-track passing track segment have been identified for grade separation. So stay tuned. Uh, I know I've been updating you almost every week, it seems, on RPP, but just since we're in some transition periods and there are some deadlines, I did want to uh, report that as of April 9th, um, all downtown and California Avenue employees are eligible to purchase employee parking permits for both the downtown and the Evergreen Park Mayfield RPP programs. This open purchase period follows a low-income employee purchase period earlier this month. Currently, enforcement activities in the downtown RPP program area are focused on siting vehicles with no permit and those reparking within the same employee parking zone. Beginning about April 17th, want to keep it uh, loose a little bit here, enforcement personnel will resume normal operations. Our staff will ensure that all eligible residents and employees have had an ample opportunity to secure permits before issuing citations for expired permits. Installation of new RPP signage in Evergreen Mayfield Park program is slated to begin uh, on Monday and take about three weeks. After the sign installation is complete, enforcement personnel will begin to issue warnings and include permit purchase instructions, and staff will ensure that all eligible residents and employees have ample opportunity to um, uh, engage with us on permits. We did want to share that Palo Alto has received an upgraded rating uh, from FEMA um, related to uh, flood insurance uh, in Palo Alto. Um, flood insurance just became a little less expensive in Palo Alto, thanks to the hard work of our departments, including emergency <laughs> services, parks and recreation, development services, and other public service operations, as well as uh, Joint Powers Authority, uh, um, the San Francisco Creek Joint Power Authority, and other organizations that have worked to put in place uh, what is called the program for public information, which is uh, used to raise what is called the community rating system that uh, ranks and then ultimately prices uh, flood insurance. 
Also, a special thanks to Councilmember Lydia Ku and to Dan Mellick for volunteers as stakeholders in this PPI program. The community rating system is a voluntary program under the National Flood Insurance Program that allows communities to earn flood insurance premium discounts by conducting floodplain management activities that exceed the um, uh, NFIP minimum requirements. The city just received notice that we've been upgraded to a rating six from sevens, which means a discount of 20%. Um, and uh, I think the mayor and I were informed on Friday at a, at a Santa Clara County Cities Association that we're the first city, I think, in the county to achieve this 20% level. And that's up from the previous 15% for our residents on flood insurance. There are 3,319 policies issued to pro property owners in the city of Palo Alto who paid $3.95 million dollars per year in flood insurance premiums for say for this re most recent year. The total annual savings to policy owners attributed to the class six rating is approximately $875,000. So lots of folks will at least see some reduction. The new rating will be effective, apply to all national flood insurance program policies issued or renewed on or before May 1st, 2017. So thanks to everybody for their help there. Um, just a few weeks ago, I um, shared uh, another recognition related to the city's uh, urban forest master plan and our recognition is a tree city. Well, uh, this week our city's city utilities department has been recognized for a third year by the Arbor Day Foundation as a tree line city USA. This is a national program that recognizes public and private utilities for practices to protect and enhance uh, America's urban forests. Our utilities folks were honored for their commitment to proper tree care practices that benefit residents by providing cleaner air, increasing property values, and improving quality of life, as well as training employees in quality tree care practices and helping homeowners to plant appropriate trees near utility lines. And then lastly, I just, uh, on behalf of all of the staff also, and uh, just to the council, did want to Thank you all for spending a, a very productive Friday afternoon and really all day Saturday at Rinconada Library at a second council retreat dealing with uh, governance effectiveness and just, you know, uh, how we can all uh, work together effectively, um, you know, and efficiently um, uh, in our city. Um, uh, I think it takes a lot of dedication for uh, and for councils to do that sort of thing, I think it's a progressive thing to do. And I, uh, again, I'm, on behalf of the staff, from our perspective, want to thank you and certainly hope it was worthwhile for all of you. Thanks. Thank you. And now we'll move to the um, consent calendar. And we have one speaker, Herb Barak, speaking on item number eight. Hmm? What did I forget? Oh, minutes. I always forget the minutes. Yeah, can we have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. All right. As amended. As amended. As amended. Uh, if we could vote on the board. And that passes unanimously. And now, Mr. Borak, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Scharf. Good evening. Uh, this is about um, item number eight, the uh, proposed uh, charter for the uh, rail committee. And uh, it's uh, related to an item at the end of your agenda, item number 12. Uh, specifically, uh, in both the purpose of the committee and in guiding principle number two, it uh, states that, uh, that the committee will focus on electrification and that it uh, equates modernization of Caltrain uh, to include electrification. Uh, I believe it's a mistake to uh, focus on electrification. Until now, the guiding principles have used the word modernization, uh, especially related to uh, number 12, which talks about a ballot measure. Uh, there are, I believe, enough people uh, on uh, the Caltrain corridor uh, who will have problems uh, with electrification as the means of modernization for Caltrain. Uh, both uh, for aesthetic reasons, uh, for the 
trees that have to be taken out and the catenaries that have to be installed and also because they would see it as the first step in high-speed rail. Um, I don't think anything is gained by mentioning electrification and therefore on this agenda item I would suggest uh, that uh, you remove this from the consent, consent calendar for, the, for two things. One, under purpose, replace the word electrification with modification. Uh, and modernization, excuse me, uh, electrification should be replaced with the word moderniz modernization. And that in uh, guiding principle two, uh, to remove the words that follow modernization. Uh, and to be consistent in the uh, item 12, when you get to that, uh, I would remove uh, the specific priority of electrifying Caltrain, or at least to change it to modernizing Caltrain. Thank you. All right, and now we need a motion on the consent calendar. I'll move the consent calendar. Second. We can vote on the board. And that passes unanimously. And now we move to our two action items. And staff has asked that I take both of these items together. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to call both 10 and 11. Um, the way we'll do is we'll have a staff report and then um, any public speakers. Um, and if anyone comes in, it's now 8 o'clock. I am going to let anyone speak who comes in like a little after 8.30 or so if they're here to want to speak. And I'll make that announcement as well. So if you want to go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. As, um, as I think uh, everybody kind of gets up here, um, I just would preface this important conversation with, if, if you wouldn't mind, me just telling you a very brief story. So when I was first in Berkeley as city manager, I, had to go, I was up at a dinner at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab with a bunch of folks. And it was fascinating because I ended up being at a table with a bunch of interesting people. And in the course of the conversation, I asked the first person they asked, uh, who they were, and they said, well, you know, I'm, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, you might have heard of me. I won the Nobel Prize for whatever, plutonium or something. And then there were three other Nobel Prize winners at the table, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is incredible. Nobel Prize winners at, at Berkeley. I mean, what is that like to win the Nobel Prize? I mean, how does your life change? And the first guy said, he said, it's the best thing in the world that happens to you. You get your own parking place and everything. So I thought, oh my God, everything comes down to parking, even the Nobel Prize. So with that, I'll turn it over to the staff on this presentation. Great, thank you, Jim. I'm Josh Mello. I'm the city's chief transportation official. I'm joined this evening by Brad Eggleston, our uh, assistant public works director, and Julie Dixon with Dixon Resources, a consulting firm which we engage to uh, conduct our downtown parking management study. This evening, we're going to have a three-phase uh, presentation for you. The first phase of the presentation will be uh, conducted by Julie. She's going to give you an overview of some data collection uh, which occurred uh, in 2016 and uh, early 2017 around our downtown parking uh, occupancy and operation. Um, she's also going to outline an intercept survey and some of the results uh, uh, from the public who uh, uses our parking on a daily basis downtown. Um, we kicked off this downtown parking management study back in early 2016, um, and one of the first phases of it was an extensive data collection. She'll give you an overview of that. The second phase of the presentation is uh, a presentation by the Public Works Department on the downtown garage uh, proposed to be located at Lot D at Waverly and Hamilton. And then we'll cap it off with a, uh, another presentation by Julie, which will outline some of the recommendations uh, that are included in the downtown parking management study and she'll explain how they all tie together to form a cohesive uh, plan for us moving forward and, uh, around downtown park parking. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Julie, and um, she can dive right into the data collection efforts and the results from the first phase of the study. Uh, the study kicked off in early 2016, and immediately upon uh, initiation, we formed a stakeholder group that inclu included downtown business owners, um, property owners, as well as uh, business operators and downtown residents and city staff from various departments. I think we held a total of five stakeholder meetings throughout the process. Um, there was a lot of coordination between uh, different departments in the city. Um, and we thought Julie and her firm 
we're best equipped to conduct this study given her background and she'll go over that in a little more detail. Great. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And it was actually, when we talk about the intercept surveys, um, we did a lot of man on the street type of interviews. We actually recruited more stakeholders during the intercept surveys as well. So we had some of your um, residents that got so intri intrigued and interested in the questions that we were asking them that they actually asked to participate and became engaged in the stakeholder meetings, which we'll talk about here today. So just a little bit about Dixon Resources Unlimited. I've been working in the parking and transportation industry my entire career. It actually started um, when I was at UC Santa Barbara as a student and I was recruited by the Sheriff's Department to become the very first parking enforcement officer for Isla Vista. Just so happens at the time, besides being the number one party school in America, we were also the most densely populated one square mile west of the Mississippi and they hadn't done any parking enforcement. So basically the lieutenant at the time handed me a ticket book and a bike and said, good luck. And uh, now many, many, many years later, uh, here I am focused on uh, parking as well. Um, also throughout my career, some of you might be familiar with the project called SF Park. SF Park was the first federally funded program associated with congestion mitigation for on and off street parking. And I was actually one of the project managers for that program from the actual solicitation of the UPA grant, as well as the implementation and managing all of the vendor um, programs and procurements that we did for the SF Park program. Dixon Resources actually started um, back in 2012 and we've been working with municipalities all across the country. And in fact, uh, your program in particular was very um, unique in the fact that there were so many factors um, of introducing the potential of paid parking because of the fact that you have such a dense occupancy need and having uh, lived in the Bay Area for over five years and having the firsthand experience, it was really um, enlightening to spend even more time on your city streets. So. Getting into what we talked about here in Palo Alto, um, I don't think it comes as any surprise because I believe that you've been hearing about this um, three-legged stool approach when it comes to the approach towards the integrated parking strategy is that today we're really going to talk a lot about the parking management and the parking supply aspect of it. But most importantly, it all really relates back to the transportation demand reductions and the hope to fund some of those opportunities and some of those solutions that come along with those programs. The overall study objectives when we basically started this was to really look at your current parking utilization within the color zone areas. I'll show a map of the color zones here in a moment, but the focus truly was the downtown parking and looking at what kind of turnover and occupancy that you actually had, as well as looking at some of the parking management strategies of how we could basically manage those parking spaces and getting into some of those longer term um, recommendations for both on and off street parking. So as I mentioned, the study and Josh said, we basically conducted data collection in May of last year, and then we came back for September and October to ensure that we basically collected the data when you were really at what I'll call full performance, so that when school was in session, uh, the university was basically in, and um, there really wasn't any kind of summer vacation schedules or anything like that, so we collected data basically May, September, and October, and we chose to collect data on Thursday and Saturday in order to show a clear representation of the utilization downtown. At the same time, we actually went out and collected the data for the intercept surveys. The intercept surveys were a combination of us going into the storefronts and actually talking to the business owners as well as the employees. We also conducted on the street interviews, uh, jogging along with some of your locals that were running off to work or running off to shop and asking them questions. And we'll talk a little bit more about those questions as well. We also had an online survey that went along with that as well. Josh mentioned the stakeholder meetings and I have to tell you, you had a very active and engaged stakeholder group. In fact, I see some of them in our audience behind us. And um, it was a very dynamic group where we had a lot of conversation and a lot of debate about some of the solutioning that we're gonna talk about here today. And I, again, I have to say, as we were able to draw in uh, further participation as we went through the process. Now to the intercept surveys. The intercept surveys basically covered an array of questions, but it dealt with everything from how did you get downtown? Um, if you drove a car, how long did it take you to find a parking space? Um, how easy was it to find a parking space? How did you know where to find a parking space? Um, how long are you coming downtown for? How long do you plan to park for? All of those types of questions were basically culled together so that what we could really, really identify was what the overall perception of parking and parking availability was, as well as the ease of being able to take alternative forms of transportation to come downtown. So now let's talk about the actual data results. 
So overall, when we talk about the issues that were identified, it really comes down to the fact that um, we were looking at the core downtown area, again, in the color zones, and when we were really looking at was just the overall capacity for those particular locations when we actually went out there and collected the overall data. So talking first about the blue zone, and before I even talk about this, let me talk a couple things about some industry theory is that there's actually parking theory, not only do the Nobel Prize winners like to look for that available parking space, but when we talk about congestion, the basic threshold is 80 to 85%. When you hit an 80 to 85% um, occupancy rate, you're basically full. The overall goal, and this goes back to the SF Park project, is where you're really looking to have one to 1.5 parking spaces available per block face, so that you basically have that ongoing turnover for parking spaces. So when we start to talk about 80%, 85%, if you're at that capacity, you're basically full. So as we start to look at your numbers, and you can actually see the blue zone is actually right below those thresholds, but you can see they're right at that number where you really need to establish that concern overall. And then when we start to get into your lime and into your coral zones, this is really your core downtown area, and this is where you have your highest occupancy. On the left side, you can actually see the data that was collected on Thursday, and on the right side, you can see the data that was collected on Saturday. We did four data collection routes, which included um, morning, afternoon, mid-afternoon, and early evening. And what you can see is that consistently, once you get past that morning hour threshold, you are basically full all day long and into the evening hours. And it is very consistent, as you can see, in the lime zone, as well as you get into the coral zone as well. I want to highlight importantly on Saturday is that on Saturdays you do not have um, time regulations or time restrictions on your Saturday parking, but you can see that the density is absolutely there when you talk about your on-street parking. The other color zone is the purple zone, and in the purple zone still on the weekday on Thursday you can see that you have the density and occupancy happening downtown, and again on to Saturday and into the evening hours it is ongoing and continuous. I don't think it's any surprise to all of you sitting here is that you definitely have an occupancy issue in downtown Palo Alto. Getting into your off-street hourly occupancy spaces, you can see that consistently on both Thursdays and Saturdays, regardless of the morning hours, all throughout the rest of the day, you are beyond full by what would be considered the industry standard. And getting into your permit parking times, you can see that your permit areas are basically below the threshold and below average, but this comes in when we're gonna talk about the recommendations. You have a parking permit that is definitely below industry standards. We did some comparable cities analysis, and we can actually see that your permit rates are very much on the lower side. In fact, you are the lowest in the region. And what we've identified through some of the interviews and some of the happenstance comments that some of your stakeholders have made is that because your permit is so affordable, there are some folks that basically are going to keep a hold of that because it's such a cheap rate. Even if they only come downtown maybe once or twice per month, it's actually more effective for them to have a guaranteed space in one of the permitted areas. You can see that on the Saturday um, day that the information, or sorry, the occupancy is well below the standard because typically people are here Monday through Friday, but that's gonna definitely tie in when we talk about the overall recommendations. We just wanted to show you some of the heat mapping and the colors aren't really that clear on the larger screen, but hopefully they show up a little bit better on your closer screen. But the colors are really to indicate really the density of parking. Now this is the overall daily average and we wanna show you that there's still quite a bit of red, but this definitely accounts for the overall three month study and it incorporates mornings. So you can actually see that there's still a lot of red, but when we really start to talk about the afternoons where we talk about your real density, you can see the abundance of red to just really show you again, those are your thresholds of where you are basically over full at this point. And into the evening hours, it's still there. And it, currently your parking rules do not extend into for time limits into the evening, but you can see that the folks are basically coming, they're coming downtown, which is a great thing and we wanna to continue to preserve that and make sure that that continues to happen. So some of the key takeaways when we talk about the actual heat maps is that 
the density is definitely in the core area and when we talk about the recommendations we're going to talk about a tiered zone but I'll save that for the later times. When we talk about occupancy in the hourly spaces the Civic Center is consistently full and the Cowper Webster lot definitely has lower thresholds. We think that that's actually tied to wayfinding and signage which again we'll talk about when we get into the recommendations as well. But overall the fact is, is that you again have a very dense location. The city has actually implemented quite a few um, ideas including the valet parking in the garages and other solutions to try to make it more efficient. But some of the items that we'll get into when we talk about recommendations will hopefully help mitigate those ideas further. Some of the other ideas that were identified as we basically went out there into data collection, we um, the way that your color zone structure is set up is that you can only stay for the time limit within that designated color zone for that day. And so we were able to identify because of the way that we did data collection that you have an abundance of folks that are actually hopscotching from color zone to color zone throughout the day. On average it's about 300 vehicles that are hopscotching throughout the day. It's actually quite a significant number when you talk about that kind of impact that, that many folks are out there basically moving their cars to try to take advantage of the time limits and that also ties into the fact that the wait list that you have for the permit zones, um, it basically makes it so that employees that are hopscotching aren't able to obtain those permits as well. So that was one of the bigger complaints that we actually received when we did the intercept survey. I can tell you from personal experience and I am a parking industry expert as they say, I actually on my first visit to Palo Alto I got two tickets on the same day and I thought I was going to tear my hair out but it was because um, the way that my license plate was captured the first time I did not realize that I was in the same color zone at the same time. So to tell you that somebody that does this for a living, I didn't understand the rules the first time that I came here and if I can't figure it out I hope that maybe is kind of a statement to maybe your average visitor as well. Um, so then getting into the wayfinding and aspects of being able to clearly find parking I think that's something that you're going to see is going to tie into the recommendations is that the areas where people could potentially park we want to be sure to be able to um, educate and inform those folks to find that available parking and then I'll turn the floor. All right, thank you, Julie. We're going to turn it over to Brad uh, from the Public Works Department now. Let me pull up your presentation. This is new PowerPoint, I think. Yeah, that's it. Everything's reorganized. <coughs> Can I have the mouse or do you want to? Yeah, that'll work. Uh, good evening, Council. I'm Brad Eggleston, Assistant Director of Public Works. And so now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the first project here that's trying to add parking supply, uh, the new downtown parking garage. And with me also here, but not um, sitting up here because of our little bit of a crowded situation, uh, Holly Boyd, who's our senior engineer in Public Works working on this project, as well as uh, several members of our design team. So just a few a summary of the brief presentation here, the status, options, and costs that we've looked at, uh, some analysis of mechanical parking that we did for this parking garage, public uh, facility zoning issues, and then the staff recommendation. And just to orient you a little again to the, the status of this project, um, not going too far back in time, but uh, we had done a feasibility study in 2014 that uh, with the council kind of settled on this site. Last September we did a request for proposals uh, for the design team on the project. Uh, we brought the design contract to council in December of last year. Uh, similar to what we uh, discussed on the California Avenue parking garage last week. Uh, really the first task for our design team, one of them, oh hello Holly. Hello. <laughs> the first task was to look at several options uh, for the garage with the goal of coming back to the council and essentially finalizing the program before we move into the design and environmental review. And then looking forward, uh, once we have those decisions, we'll be jumping right into the EIR scoping and ARB process. Uh, with a goal of certifying the EIR next February, so it's a little behind the process on our other parking garage, completing the final design uh, later next year, 
and then actually completing construction of the garage winter 2020. And that's a little confusing sometimes, but what we mean is very early in 2020, not very late in 2020. Uh, this is just a view of the existing lot D. So uh, kind of to the right of the lot, that street is Hamilton and up towards the top right, the cross street is Waverly. Uh, next to the lot, the red terracotta roof, that's the post office across the street. Uh, the large building kind of down to the bottom left is the AT&T building. So just to orient you briefly. Okay, and in kind of kicking off this project, we looked at the three options that are shown in this table and that were described in the staff report. Um, a little context, when the infrastructure plan was adopted in 2014, the goal for this project in reference to Lot D was to add an additional 214 net spaces or so to the 86 spaces that exist on the lot. So we wanted to have a garage with about a total of 300 spaces to be able to do that. And that was envisioned at that time to have a total project budget of $13 million. So option A in this table is really uh, just the base option that was in the feasibility study from 2014. It doesn't have basement levels. It's uh, five levels above. In, in fact, all three of these options are five above ground levels. It doesn't have retail. And then you see the project cost and cost per stall. Uh, option B was an option where we started to look at adding retail along the Waverly frontage. Uh, kind of uh, similar to discussion last week, important thing to note is that at least with the amount of retail that we showed in this option, which is about 3,800 square feet, you're required to provide 16 parking spaces. So it kind of takes away from the net addition. So you'll see that although we've lost some total parking stalls here, um, 12 of them, in fact, uh, because of the of providing the retail space, the net difference of the spaces we're adding is even a, a greater difference at a, a net of 189. So this is the option that has the retail. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to say about that is in looking at this, we asked our consultants to kind of look at what's the maximum retail space that you could include on that ground floor. We don't necessarily mean to propose that that's what we'd go with. Um, even recently, we've been talking to some adjacent property owners who kind of looked at that and said, wow, you know, the, the sweet spot for retail in this kind of a setting would really be more like on the 1,500 square feet and maybe you'd want to skinny that up. So in the end, this is not designed yet and that could change thereby adding more parking and less of the need for parking in the retail. Uh, then option C, we wanted to look at what would be the cost and how many spaces would we gain on this site if we were to include a basement level. So this is essentially adding a basement level in addition to the five above ground levels. So you see there that we end up with a total amount of spaces of, of 351 with a, a, the net addition being 265. Um, this option C doesn't include the retail. And so for comparison to the base option, you can see really what we're doing is, is adding an additional 48 parking spaces. Um, and at, at a considerable cost though, with the project cost um, increasing to over 22 million. Uh, so as you read in the staff report, the staff recommendation is the option B where we would have the five above ground levels, not have a basement and have some retail component. Um, essentially in reaching that conclusion, we wanted to continue the existing retail that exists along Waverly as an urban design best practice. Um, we were interested in looking to see, could we add additional parking with the basement option? Uh, looking at that, it didn't seem very cost effective. When you look at those 48 incremental spaces you gain, for those spaces, the additional cost um, nets to be about a little over $85,000 per additional space. 
So even though you would see a, a cost per stall for the overall garage that's not that much higher, you're paying a lot for those additional spaces that are in the basement. Uh, this slide is just providing a, a layout of the option B retail um, that we looked at. Um, I didn't want to go into great detail about it except to show that kind of on the bottom right, that shaded pink sort of area is the retail, the 3,800 square feet. And you can see it goes uh, quite far back into the uh, garage layout. Um, at the top of the retail, you see a, a smaller square. That's a bike storage area of about 500 square feet that we're working on trying to incorporate. And then one other thing I would point out is that um, kind of at the top and to the right of this L shape, you see the, the sort of narrow um, tan area there. That's pedestrian access um, that leads to Waverly and, and back along the back towards CVS. And this is an area where you probably saw letters from the adjacent property owners discussing plans they may have in the future to redevelop those sites and the need to provide um, access to, to most likely underground parking. Uh, so we've discussed this and we do think that there are ways that we can work with our design team and those property owners to try to make sure that um, we can provide for future access to parking. The mechanical parking, so in this garage, uh, we, we did consider mechanical parking um, originally as one of the options and we haven't laid it out in the, that other table because there were reasons we found out problems with it that we um, were not proposing to move forward, but I will, did want to talk about this. So um, we evaluated mechanical parking lifts, the puzzle lift type systems for options B and C, the retail and the basement. And what we were able to find is that on the ground level for the retail option, that would be the space where we could, we could net an additional 17 parking spaces on the ground level um, at a cost of about 1.1 million. So $65,000 of space for those kind of additional spaces, the incremental cost. Um, you know, we found that to be similar to the overall cost of spaces for the garage, but uh, we thought that ha having those mechanical puzzle lift systems on that ground floor where people are walking around and it's also the area that people are driving through the garage to access the ramps uh, probably didn't add that much value given that it was only 17 spaces we were talking about. And by the way, I have to point out there's a mistake in the staff report where we discussed this. We said 27 spaces, it should be 17. Then we also looked at, um, you know, what if, if you were to have a basement level where you sort of maximize the use of these input, in pit puzzle lift systems and could really increase the, the number of parking spaces. So what we found is that we could net an additional 54,000 parking spaces 54. Yeah. <laughs> Problem solved. Nice try, 54, We're going to go down a thousand <laughs> levels. Um, excuse me. 54 spaces at an additional cost of 3.4 million, um, which again, that's $63,000 a space, which is kind of in the zone of what we seem to be expecting to pay for spaces in this garage. The problem with that and why we didn't want to propose that is that necessitates that first you build um, the entire basement level, which was the $85,000 per space spaces in the basement. So um, also the, these systems, we had some discussion about this last week, but they are semi-automatic, but they do require some training, which is part of the reason that they're um, not recommended for high peak hour volume facilities and um, in discussions with our consultants not typically included in, in public parking facilities. They're being used more and more often in um, private developments, especially residential where there's some relatively small shortage in parking that can be addressed through the systems. Um, and since we're talking about these, I just wanted to, if people hadn't seen them, give you some idea of what they looked like. It's kind of like a, 
a cage that opens and allows you to, to uh, drive onto the platform and then it closes and places the car either ab above or below where there's an available spot. The other recommendation other than the, the program for the garage that we're discussing tonight is revising the zoning for the public facility zoning. And there are a number of ways that the PF public facility zoning does not accommodate public parking garages. So we've listed some of them here. Um, we discussed before the issue of um, 35 foot height limit within residential, near uh, residential uses. Um, that's actually not a concern for this garage. We don't have residential districts. There's the limiting site coverage to 30%. Um, in this instance, uh, the design work we've done so far indicates a site coverage of about 81%. So to illustrate that difference, uh, the requirement for one to one floor area ratios, the proposal here to have five above ground levels is about a four to one floor area ratio. And then uh, various requirements for setbacks. So the PF code um, would require a 20 foot setback um, what we're currently showing in our layouts is a two foot setback, which is consistent with all of the other buildings that are along Hamilton here. So then the staff recommendation is to uh, finalize the uh, program here to proceed with the preliminary design and environmental review for the option that has retail, the 291 parking spaces, and with five levels of above ground parking as well as uh, directing staff to proceed with the revisions we've discussed to the PF um, zoning ordinance. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Brad. So you're coming back to your presentation. Yes, right? we're gonna do the, uh, we're gonna go through the recommendations from the downtown parking management study very quickly and then we'll have a Q&A session. So now I'm back uh, talking about the uh, parking recommendations. We're gonna actually go through each of these individually as we go through these slides. But one of the things that I really wanna highlight is the fact that the recommendations that are tied in here are basically all interrelated. They're very much intertwined. It's not a one-off. It's basically a comprehensive solution that we're recommending here. And everything that you're seeing here is really about improving the overall experience of basically traveling to downtown whether it be via alternative transportation or via car. We're trying to facilitate access and basically make it more efficient and effective. And that's the reason why during the previous presentation, I tried to highlight the issue of occupancy and what the uh, utilization opportunity of trying to achieve 85% or lower um, so that we can try to and encourage that turnover and transition so that you have available parking spaces. One of the things that we don't know today is, we don't know how many people don't currently come downtown because of the parking experience. And so one of those numbers that we really can't forecast is, you know, we always hear folks say, well, you're gonna do this and people aren't gonna come downtown. We truly don't know how many people aren't currently coming downtown because they can't find parking. So there's always kind of that pros and cons aspect of it, but this overall opportunity is to really try to improve the overall experience as we start to talk about some of these solutions. One of the things that's important here is we're gonna talk about what we call a parking roadmap, is that not everything that we can do can happen overnight. This is something that's incremental and the process really starts tonight in the fact that when we start to talk about outreach and engagement, nothing in parking happens in a vacuum. This is a dynamic process and everything that we're gonna talk about today, there has to be a public outreach component tied in with anything that you do with parking, whether it be messaging, signage, rate structures, permit increases, any of the details we're gonna talk about today, there's absolutely an active um, engagement program that goes along with that. And that's something that's tied in with everything that we're gonna talk about tonight. So getting into the first part of the solution, I think I might need the, oh, there we go. There we go, the complete parking management solution. So this really comes back to what we call the CPMS, which ties in everything associated with the downtown parking program. So it makes it for an efficient management tool for the city and city staff to be able to um, run and manage the overall parking solutions that go into play. 
The very first part of that has to do with permit management. You have a substantial permit program already existing today. We want to make it customer friendly, make it efficient and effective, and make it easy to use. And some of that comes into the first component when we start to talk about this complete parking management solution. Also a part of that is compliance. And when we talk about compliance, that means parking enforcement is the tools that are used to manage the parking enforcement, whether it be the citation handhelds or whether it be the ability to issue warning notices and using the various technologies associated with that to ensure compliance. Because no matter what you do, parking regulations have to be enforced. Again, whether it is enforcement tickets or whether it be warning notices, and that's an important aspect of this comprehensive parking management tool, but a real focus on customer efficiencies that tie into that overall management system. So now let's talk about paid parking. As we, sorry, the slides aren't moving as fast. There we go. So I'm um, talking about how to basically implement paid parking in the downtown area. Is our recommendation is, is that you are going to implement paid parking for both on and off street. So for your street locations and your off street, including parking lots, surface lots, as well as garages. And what you're going to see in this next slide is being able to replace the existing color zones with paid parking and then introducing what we'll call a tiered parking rate structure. And what that has to do with is, and I'll just go ahead and move to this slide, Based upon the demand that you saw from the different um, color zones and the different occupancy rates, what we're suggesting is to basically divide the downtown area up into different tier zones so that if you're parking in the most dense locations where you see tier one, you actually would pay a higher rate for your hourly occupancy, whether it be on and off street. And then as you move from the inner core to the outer core, you'll actually see the opportunity to decrease those different tier rates. What you see here basically are simply proposed rates. These are not necessarily the way to go moving forward. It's basically just a starting point so that we could start to actually look at some potential forecasts. So as we talk about how this actually could end up implicating or impacting the actual downtown area. Importantly too is that when we talk about this rate structure, you'll notice that tier two and tier three are actually currently structured at the same rate zone structure. And what we're saying is, is that s establish the tiers currently at the beginning, even though the rates may be the same, because what you want to be able to do is have a dynamic and flexible solution where you're defining your tiers today, and then it gives you the ability to maybe tier three ends up becoming cheaper, tier two becomes a midpoint, and tier one ends up becoming the most expensive potentially. But this is all to allow your city staff, the resources and ability to be flexible, but you wanted to design a system that can be adaptable with the future and with the growth of Palo Alto as well. And I also want to highlight the daily maximum is for the off street locations. The intent now is to also, you're going to see, we're going to recommend putting in what's called a parks system, which is access control systems into the garages. So that right now it's a little bit complicated today if you try to park in the garage and if you are basically looking to stay all day and how to attain a permit to park all day. And now what we're basically saying is you basically pay for use. Like most of you probably, if you go to a location today where you pull a ticket when you pull into the garage and then you end up paying for the time used, that's basically what we're looking for with establishing a daily maximum of $24. Now I have to identify that all of the rate structures, again, while this is a starting point, this all ties into play with the recommendations for your permit program because one of the things that you have to look to do when you talk about industry standards is you want the off street parking to be affordable so that the people that are coming to park for the day, you don't want them circling your downtown streets and causing traffic congestion. You want them to immediately go to a surface lot or go to a garage where they can park more affordably and stay for a longer period of time. If they're gonna come down, grab a bite to eat, run into a shop, park at one of the locations on street, use your time, spend your money, go open up that space so somebody else can come and do the same thing. The intent is for your longer term parkers to park in the off street locations, as well as you have to find a balance of what that daily maximum is compared to what your permit rate is too. So there's a whole mathematical equation that goes into trying to figure out what the rates are. It's a little bit complicated, but it definitely ties into the fact that you want your permits to be affordable so that you can encourage people who are going to park downtown that they can have an affordable rate. But if you are going to come down just for the day and you're going to stay for the term, we want to make sure that you're parking in those off-street garage locations as well as the surface lots. 
So what you also see here, we're going to talk a little bit about the technology, and it's a little bit harder to see on the larger screen, but what we're also encouraging as you implement paid parking on street, we're recommending that you use smart parking technology that allows for you to pay with credit cards as well as coins, as well as we'll talk about mobile payment. You want to make it as easy to use as possible for any opportunity to pay. And then what we're also suggesting is along the inner core you would actually implement single space meters and along the outer perimeter you would actually use pay stations. There's a couple of reasons for this. Number one is budget. The single space meters can prove to be expensive and we're talking about quite a few parking spaces. But also importantly it's an aesthetic issue as well. Is that when we're talking about that footprint of all of that street furniture there could be a pole in every single parking space so we're suggesting for the outer perimeter locations where maybe there's not as much use you potentially consider the pay stations that look a little bit like this. The meters on the left side I think anywhere in the Bay Area you have probably become familiar with. Um, they're very prominent and very popular. And on the right side are just some examples of what we call multi-space pay stations. Now we have another thing, not to make this too complicated, but when you start to put in pay stations you have the option of going what's called pay by space, pay and display, or also pay by license plate. And when we talk about pay by license plate, that's something that we're suggesting as we start to talk about your permit program is that a lot of agencies are going into what we'll call a digital permit or what we'll call a virtual permit where your license plate actually becomes your permit number and then you can actually manage the compliance from license plate recognition technology as a consideration as well. But these are all factors that don't have to be decided on today. It just gives you options and flexibility for that parking roadmap as the system deploys. But pay by space is very much popular when we start to talk about the parking paid technology. Now talking a little bit about mobile payment. Any type of solution that you put in place when it comes to paid parking solutions, you need to have a mobile payment solution. All of your surrounding communities currently have these and I would encourage that this be something that is implemented from the get-go. It's a customer convenience and makes it easy for the people to pay and it also gives, if you establish a policy, the opportunity for people to extend their parking um, time limits as well. That is a policy decision that's not necessarily for discussion today but it's a very easy front, easy, you, user-friendly application that is very well used throughout the various jurisdictions locally. Active monitoring. As I said at the beginning, it's, it's very important to consider that everything we're talking about today is meant to be dynamic and it's something that will continue to grow and evolve as your community continues to develop. It's important that you continue to look at your occupancy to determine what your rates are and what they maybe should be. I mentioned the tier one, tier two, tier three zone. The reason why is because you might find that you're not having the occupancy in the tier three zone, so maybe it's an opportunity to potentially lower the rates. Whereas maybe the density in the downtown hasn't been improved, that could be an opportunity to increase the rates. When you really start to look at the SF Park study, what a lot of folks don't know is there was actually a substantial parts of San Francisco where the rates actually came down as a result of the occupancy and the density studies that were done along with the program. I know it may not seem like that for those of you that park in San Francisco because it can be expensive, but the reason why you look at the occupancy studies is to make sure that you're looking at the rates and what are appropriate for those particular locations to encourage your thresholds and the turnover that we're looking for. Now let's talk about permits. I already mentioned at the onset that your permits are definitely on the lower side. When we went and looked at the comparable cities and the other agencies that are in the uh, Bay Area, you're definitely on the lower side. Again, I can't emphasize that enough because your permits are very cheap. Um, but the one thing that we really want to push for is also looking at the increases to your parking permit program, but also continuing the reduced price for your low income employees. That's actually a model that you all use that I have to ta say that we've actually taken on to other jurisdictions because of the fact that it's very important that you have to be able to provide affordable permits for your service workers. Without your service workers, obviously it can have a real big impact on your downtown. Uh, one of the things that we also got from the intercept surveys was being able to actually offer frequent payment options so that right now they have to buy the permits for an annual basis and the suggestion of actually allowing them to buy monthly and or quarterly permits we thought that that would actually make it more um, inviting for some of your service workers and make it more affordable we thought that that was really important. 
The other aspect too that was discussed throughout the um, uh, throughout the stakeholder groups was also making the permit uh, permits downtown to be consistent with the cost of actually using the alternative transportation, so like the Caltrain permits, and being able to make them basically comparable in order to further encourage people to use alternative forms of transportation. Off-street infrastructure. I had mentioned that the proposal is to put in what's called a parks system or parking access revenue control systems. It's basically gating your garages. Um, currently, with the number of spaces that you have, your parking enforcement officers actually have to walk the garages and actually verify every single vehicle, and it's absolutely inefficient. And I have to tell you, your enforcement officers are very efficient. Like I told you, I got two tickets in one day. But um, the, the, uh, but I have to say is that to make it a more effective program and also make it more customer friendly um, by being able to pull a ticket or basically uh, flash a QR code, a, a code or an access control card, it makes it very user friendly and it also actually makes it more efficient for your permit holders too. Um, and I think that this really ties in with some of the overall um, solutioning that's coming to the city as we start to talk about some of the different open fare networks and being able to tie this in with the regional transit cards and things like that. Those were all factors that were considered in trying to look at um, possible customer conveniences and solutions. Parking guidance and wayfinding. So what I highlighted at the onset was being able to encourage folks and be able to identify where parking is available. It's something that we know the city is currently working on, but being able to establish a parking brand, I know that may sound silly, but um, one of the things when you come into a jurisdiction and you have a consistent message or a consistent sign that shows you where parking is available, it just makes it very easy. Again, being a real kind of first time visitor to really hanging out in downtown, it's not necessarily intuitive when you come downtown to where to find parking. Some of the items that have been identified are some parking guidance signs, so that when you come into the main arterials to be able to define the directions of where parking is available, you're also going to now have smart systems in place with the parking access control systems that are gonna be able to tell you available parking. Not only can you do this via signage, but there's also a number of applications as well as interactive um, mapping programs that will be able to guide me to where parking is tied into. I know you've heard a lot over this last year, probably about first mile, last mile. We want people to plan their trips before they basically even leave home so that they consider, gosh, if there's not a lot of parking, maybe I do jump on the train or jump on the bus or grab you know, an alternative form of transportation downtown. But this is all tied in for the wayfinding and signage and it's really an important part of the overall solution. Now let's talk about enforcement. Not everybody likes to talk about enforcement. In fact, a lot of folks think that's you know, just a horrible aspect of parking. But I have to really emphasize the fact that enforcement is a necessity when we talk about anything parking related. But when I talk about enforcement, I always like to use the term compliance because the reason why we have rules is to ensure that people comply with the rules and just to make sure that we're having consistent enforcement of the rules is absolutely important. We are suggesting that you should extend your parking enforcement services into the evenings and to the weekends. You all saw the statistics with the blue graphs and the different colors, et cetera. You have a parking challenge on the weekends. The people are coming downtown, which is amazing, but we wanna make sure that we're basically enforcing the rules and making sure people aren't basically violating or parking in red zones or double parking or blocking fire hydrants. So we do encourage that you extend those rules as well as into the evening hours. We think that that's really important that you absolutely consider that. And then also being able to look at the technology that your enforcement officers are carrying. It's going to be very important that there are real time integrations with the infrastructure that we're talking about. It'll make them more efficient in the field. And I talked earlier about the license plate recognition technology. This will absolutely be an efficiency tool that will help your enforcement officers in managing and monitoring the downtown parking rules and regulations. Centralized parking operation. One of the challenges that we had as we ran this parking study over this last almost, I'd say, eight months or so is that you don't have a centralized parking operation in Palo Alto, and it's something that we are recommending that you do bring the program basically under one department, one centralized group. 
Um, right now it's fragmented throughout the city and various departments, everybody kind of has a piece of the pie or involved in the operation, which again, to be as successful as you all have to date, it's been amazing considering the amount and volume that you do downtown. But I will say in order to be effective for the long term, to be able to have that centralized program and really working from the best practices approach, we think is really going to be essential for the long term success of your parking operation. And again, parking isn't going to disappear tomorrow. I know we hear a lot about autonomous vehicles and things like that, but from all of the industry standards, we're still 20 to 30 plus years away. I know that you guys are the tech center and I'm sure if it happens anywhere, it's probably gonna happen here first. But in the meantime, I don't know about you, but I'm not giving my car up tomorrow. And I don't think a lot of people are. So we really need to be considerate of that when we start to talk about the solutioning is we need to plan for today and not necessarily just thinking about what's gonna happen in 20 to 30 years. So a couple of items we wanted to outline here was when it came to the recommendations and what I said at the beginning is this does not happen overnight and the outreach program is absolutely tied into this. But what you can see here is basically over the next two years, the solutioning that we've outlined here and how to basically roll it out and the timelines to implement it. Another aspect that I should talk about when we talk about the parking technology, especially the meters, one of the ideas that we shared with the group was to actually be able to test and pilot some of the technology. Uh, the vendors that are out there will bring technology to you and we can set it up so that the city, the community, you, yourselves can come out and actually use the technology, see that you're comfortable with the technology. I always like to explain that all of those machines that you saw can all basically do the same thing. They can all basically accept payment for parking. It's about the user interface, the display screen, the buttons, and what you all like for your preferences. So we really encourage that that type of evaluation process occur throughout this timeline that we've identified. But it's something that you'll see will basically be an ongoing process throughout the uh, structure. And I think that this is basically just a summary of the overall recommendations and I will let um, Josh take it from there. Great, thank you, Julie. And uh, we do have representatives from the four departments that operate parking in Palo Alto. We have planning and community environment, uh, administrative services department, public works, as well as the police department available for your uh, questions. And that concludes our presentation. Well, thanks. I think we should have a, a quick round of questions maybe. Um, no more than three minutes before we left. Yes. I mean, it's a really big item. Can we split up the garage and the uh, So the I think when we come to motions, we should split it up. I, I think, you know, let's, let's do a round of questions on, on, on both, and then we can split it if you want. I want the public to then speak, and then we can come back. We'll, split, we'll do the garage first, and then we'll do the, the parking. You'll have other times to ask questions, too. Do you want to go first, Tom? Okay, Lydia, do you have any questions? Okay, three minutes. So, um, I see that uh, the garage is gonna be 49.10. So even with the solar panels, once it goes up, when it goes up, if it goes up, is it gonna still be at under 50 or at 50? Where is that gonna be at? With, with a solar panel canopy, it would be about seven feet higher than um, the 49 foot 10 inches. So, so it's that, still that under would 50. So that's put it at 50, 56 to 57 56. feet at the top of a solar canopy. Okay. And um, the garage, is that going to be, um, does the parking assessment district folks who paid into it, do they get any space in there? Uh, no, no one gets any, no. No. I'd say the answer is no. Um, the apportionment of the spaces between permit spaces and hourly spaces would be at the discretion of our parking program. So basically, we're just kind of talking about the garage right now, nothing about enforcement, et cetera. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Council Member Wabach. Okay. Uh, so first, um, in the garage, uh, I might have missed it. Uh, do we have designated spaces, even scattered and tucked in corners, uh, for motorcycles and scooters uh, in there? Um, I'm thinking of you know, even experiences in no. places like our Cal Ave garages and Mountain View, where there are places that aren't officially designated but are generally seen as okay for people to squeeze their two wheeled vehicles. Um, uh, we don't have anything shown right now. We, we haven't designated anything yet in these layouts. Okay. 
Um, and as far as what staff's really looking for tonight, like how much, you know, when it comes back to us for motions later, how much direction are you really looking for us and how much detail should we basically just be providing comments later uh, with our thoughts about things we'd be looking for when this comes back or, you know, I don't want to over prescribe, but I don't want to miss an opportunity. It's on the garage and the um, parking management study as far as specificity. Yes, I, I think uh, we're looking for more specificity on the garage in terms of recommending one of the options, and we've recommended option B. Okay, and would it be possible to do um, uh, option B plus a basement garage with mechanical lifts? Yes, it would. Okay, and would it be possible to designate that basement and have the entrance that be separate for uh, long-term permits, so it's not for you know people who are just coming in for the day, but maybe you know the monthly, quarterly, annual passes. So, as part of the new garage construction, we would install the automated parking guidance system, the single space system, which actually allows us to change the parking space designation in real time. So, you know, if not a lot of permit holders showed up one particular day, we could actually release some permit spaces in real time for hourly parkers. Okay, um, and would it be possible to have, um, uh, what would the implications be of preserving the two or three hour time limit for zone one, uh, but not including a time limit for zone two or especially zone three? Uh, if we want to allow people to do what you described in the report as a pay to stay. What, so, yeah, what would, basically, what would the negatives to that be? So, um, Julie can talk a little bit about that, but I'll say that our current staff recommendation in regards to the downtown parking management study is that council direct us to uh, work with the Planning and Transportation Commission to refine these recommendations and uh, further engage in public. Uh, communications and community engagement to help refine those and discuss exactly those type of modifications or refinements. But Julie can talk to specific impacts. Sure, so pay to stay was actually debated quite, uh, um, I'll say aggressively during our stakeholder meetings. And uh, one of the thoughts that came back was that um, folks in your community would be willing to pay a premium to stay and the fact that it might actually inhibit those that maybe couldn't afford to pay that premium to allow them those parking spaces. So the fear was if you allow pay to stay, and meaning that you literally pay for the premium of parking in that on-street space, is that you wouldn't encourage the utilization or turnover that we're typically looking for in a downtown core because that space will now be occupied throughout the entire day. So let's just say that space was in front of Joe's coffee shop um, and I chose to pay to stay there all day, then Joe's Coffee Shop won't experience that opportunity to turn that parking space over throughout the day. And then also the fact that there might be a community member who necessarily couldn't afford to pay to stay, and that might be um, basically not encouraging others to basically be able to park downtown. So it was something that not the entire stakeholder group agreed upon because some of the folks said, let's get them pay to stay, let's get the money, let's make it happen. But what we were really looking to do is encourage the, for the space turnover and to basically look at that kind of commerce and that opportunity to make it fair and equitable to everybody. Thank you. Council Member Ness. So, and Brad, thank you for your uh, mechanical garage information. I appreciate that. Um, I want to go to your parking options considered and look at the, at the, at the price. So Councilmember Walbach just asked you about the basement. If we were to do option C with the basement and retail, what, what is that coming out to both in project cost and in cost per stall? And while you do the math on that, let me ask the other question. Any idea of the price for putting in the, um, this incredible whiz-bang parking um, option type of, of arrangement with flashing lights and everything else imaginable, which sounds great, but um, I, I'm wondering what the price tag is. So our latest estimate for the automated parking guidance system was uh, $2 million, but that just includes 
uh, construction, installation costs, there's soft costs like uh, software, um, there may be wiring required in the garages, but uh, the last time we brought it to you, our estimate was about $2 million, and that's for the single space system. Okay, and how about, how about the parking meters? I don't have the numbers in front of me today, but we actually created a financial modeling workbook. I'm going to let Josh look at the sheet that he brought here today. But the financial modeling workbook allow, allows the city to basically plug in the various numbers if they went pay stations versus single space. But I would just say from a ballpark perspective to equip the entire downtown area, we're probably just under a million dollars. I'm going to guess about that number if Josh sees anything different on the sheet. But um, that's probably on the higher end, but that should be able to cover you. And then you talk about the on, there's some ongoing fees that are basically associated with that as well. But that should cover you for the entire downtown area. So for around three million, you, you really move into the technical age, right? Right. Yeah. Brad? I would estimate that we'd add about a million dollars to the cost of option C, bringing that to 23.5 million. Um, that could vary somewhat depending that, on that's the, to put retail in that's to have retail um, along with the basement yes but if and the retail were to make some money wouldn't that offset some of this or not that's right it would and I think we estimated that the retail could bring in net operating income of about hundred sixty thousand dollars a year if, if rented at market rates at, and that would be assuming that the 3,800 square foot space, which I was saying we, we might Probably want to reconsider. Too big. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Philseth. Um, thank you. So I got a couple of really low level questions about the garage and a couple of really high level ones about the plan. Um, do you know how high, how tall is the AT&T building next door to, the, to that lot? Uh, we took some approximate measurements, about 60 feet. 60 feet, and that's at the very highest point because there's that one sort of spur that Cheer. sticks up a little bit. Uh, I, I think the, the highest point is higher than 60 feet. Okay. Maybe like four feet higher than that. Okay. Um, and uh, right now, uh, next to uh, Diban, uh, where the garage would go, where that walkway would go, there's a great big tree. Would that tree have to go? Or can that stay? Yeah. Looks like it's where the walkway is. So I think there's about three trees on existing lot D. They would all need to go. Okay. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, uh, one of my colleagues asked a question about the uh, the solar uh, solar uh, potential solar canopy. Um, is there also an elevator extension uh, at the top, and how high does that go? If there is one. There is, and, and that would be about eight feet, I believe. So then it would be about 57 feet to the top of the elevator. Okay. Um, so uh, on the the the, the, the parking plan, <clears throat> um, one of the things I noticed we got sort of a mix of meters in some places and pay spaces in others. And I, I mean, I think all our natural inclination is this thing. To really get acceptance, it's got to be really, really simple, right? I mean, as you pointed out, right? Is it too complicated to mix all these different kinds, or should we just pick one and put it everywhere? So it really does come down to community preference. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, it becomes an aesthetic issue where, yep. you know, again, having the single space meters per space. I will say that the um, opportunity to make it easy mm -hmm. is definitely single space everywhere. That's what I would have guessed. As long as the community is acceptable to this. And then okay. to get back, Council Member, Vice Mayor, to get to your question, um, when we talk about the cost of the infrastructure, we pulled up the workbook. Um, to do a hybrid solution where you would have the mix, we're basically right at $1.2 million, right below that cost for all of the solution with the mix of it. Mm. If we went single space only, we're mm -hmm. just over $1.5 million. Okay. So it's absolutely feasible. Um, when we talk about the long-term ongoing costs, it pretty much kind of balances out. In the end, pay stations do tend to be slightly cheaper for the long-term just mm -hmm. because of the maintenance aspects and things like that. But right. to make yes. it easy, 
without a doubt that's the case. In San Francisco in particular, um, there was a location where we had put pay stations in, and within a year we went back and put the single space back in. I was going to say it was single space easier. everywhere in the city, isn't it? Absolutely. All right, um, you're done. I could, if if I, I could, a couple more. if I could, done. I can't be done. <laughs> you know, you can come back. All right, if I could add to that. Um, the, that's the on-street equipment. The off-street equipment is estimated to be about an additional 650000 so that would be the gates and the revenue collections equipment for the garages. And um, ASD may be able to talk a little bit more about this, but it's not a simple calculation. Uh, there's a lot of other moving parts, like the cost of enforcement, um, the wayfinding signage. Um, there's a whole host of other costs that need to be analyzed when we look at all of these recommendations. Um, so uh, my question is about, um, it's similar to um, Council Member Wolbach's question, which is, you know, I think having low cost of free parking is actually important. And um, so one thing I want to ask is, if, if you guys are implementing license plate readers, could you implement a system, let's say for, for tier one, where the first two hours are free, and then after that, they have to pay. And if they don't pay, they get a ticket, even if they move somewhere else. Is that possible? I will say that Anything is possible, the vendors will tell you, right? Um, technology can be developed. It becomes an issue of management. Is the frequency of being able to enforce that and being able to manage it, the technology is not perfect. When we talk about license plate recognition technology simply for on street, we're probably talking about a mid-90s level of accuracy, if that. And um, so when you start to talk about those types of drivers, I will say that is it possible? Yes, but it will not be a perfect system. And um, the one challenge that we have in parking is the folks that try to beat the system, just like you currently have the folks that are doing the hopscotching from zone to zone. I will tell you that it would be absolutely challenging. Where you would want to try to offer that type of an opportunity with being able to look at how you modeled your off street rates because if you're wanting to do things like that where you know it's a lower rate for the first hour or potentially the first hour is free well what, what i guess intent is to keep the friction low because we do have stopping uh, stafford shopping center and we have other areas where there's retail and it's free parking where the first couple hours are free but if we have lps we should be able to know if they be parked in you know again they just move the car right we should be able to do that, not so, have to worry about the coral, you know, the four color system. So I think the answer is it would be easier to do that in the garages than it would be on the lots and the street, the on-street parking with current technology. Okay. Uh, second question is, did you guys look at having lifts, mechanical lifts throughout the whole garage versus just the ground floor and basement? No, we, we didn't do that because then that would require um, greatly increasing the floor to ceiling heights? Well, it depends on what kind of system, because uh, um, I guess, did you only look at puzzle lifts or did you look at other systems as well? We looked at puzzle lifts. Okay. Are you referring to the, the fully um, robotic garages? Yeah, because I, I've seen a lot of them where, I think the last garage we looked at only had 10% of the volume of the garage being cars, or maybe 11% of the garage being cars. And if you pack them a lot closer together, you could get much higher density. But you can't, be, you can't build it the same way you build, you build a regular garage. Right. What we did do this week was go back and look a little bit more at, at more information about the West Hollywood garage. So that was interesting. And I could show some more information about that if you were interested. Basically, what we found is that it looked like the cost for, um, at least for that type of garage, for the size of garage that we're proposing, would probably be a little bit higher than what we're proposing here and then would have ongoing higher um, maintenance costs and the need for a full-time attendant at the garage. Councilmember Fine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's very helpful. Uh, one question about the garage. Um, so there's a lot of pedestrian access and kind of desire paths that people walk there already, coming from across from the post office, coming from the church or the Wells Fargo, or coming from uh, Bryant down towards the CVS, and kind of that CVS is the node. Um, was there any consideration given to potentially maintaining pedestrian access, particularly on the southwest side of the lot? So I know you did it on the north side towards um, Taipan and behind Toyn Sports World, but what about in between the garage and the ATT building? Is there any possibility of that? Basically, to provide this, this and I, I could ask um, Michelle from Watry to, to speak to this too, but 
to be able to provide the 16 foot pedestrian access that essentially runs between the garage and Taipan back towards CVS and um, to have the drive aisle uh, widths that were necessary in the garage we had to essentially bring um, the AT&T okay. and close that off. All right, thank you. Um, I can encourage you to continue looking at that if there is a way to finesse something there. Um, two questions about the, the parking management study, and thank you very much. I thought it was an excellent report. Um, so one, this is to our city manager. Um, do you have an opinion or does staff have an opinion about consolidating parking into one department or an office? Um, what that means operationally, what the cost would look like for the city? Um, no, uh, we haven't looked at it, um, but um, obviously um, fragmentation of responsibility typically is less efficient. So, I mean, I think the ability to um, align and consolidate for the most part, I mean, I would say based on prior experience in other areas um, is a good thing. Um, Sometimes being able to make that transition has a lot of costs associated with it. But I think once we ultimately got there, it would be, um, it would be more efficient than what we have now. Okay. And I, I particularly think since this is coupled with having a very kind of dynamic, interactive, changeable system, that, you know, that really makes a big difference. I think, you know, having a unified, um, support structure. Okay, thank you. And, and just last question along that. You've spoken about a couple hard costs and soft costs. Um, do you know how quickly the system would be able to pay itself back just a ballpark? So Kylie from AST has some, done some very initial projections and she should be able to speak to thank that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kylie, the budget director. Um, let me caveat, these are super preliminary, but ultimately we ran a few numbers on uh, a couple scenarios and it's gonna be a couple years before these projects would be able to be repaid most likely. Um, just given the ramp up, just given the ramp up time of uh, you know socializing all the fees with the, the community, when we would actually institute um, each component of paid parking. Um, most obviously the CIP components are going to happen over the course of the next two fiscal years, whereas your revenues are going to start coming in in that kind of second, third, fourth year. So most likely you won't start making money until, I don't know, third or fourth year of this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Holman. Yes, thank you, Kylie, while you're, while you're up. <laughs> um, I'll ask the question while you're walking is, um, what's the anticipated in anticipated revenue generation then once it starts generating revenue? It is extraordinary. Be careful. I was going to say it's extraordinarily dependent on what you guys decide to recommend. It's the the tiered fa um, the tiers pricing. Uh, if you guys choose to go with maybe the first hour free versus you know everything is automatically a paid parking. Um, I would honestly say from where you're currently at in terms of the revenues in this fund, you collect about two million annually from just your existing permits um, and your day passes. If I I'm could- I'm such afraid to give you a number, well, I'd say no, probably. Well, uh, I, yeah, I don't, we don't want to do this because, I mean, we, not only we haven't worked it out, but it really is dependent upon the choices you make. I do yeah. think we could safely say this, that uh, because there could be enough variation that once we had gotten through the, you know, capitalization and the, you know, the implementation phase, there would be, I think, clearly a sufficient revenue stream to really support our TMA objectives and TDM investments that we want to make that would have a reciprocal benefit on our overall parking and traffic situation. Okay, just noting it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg, depending on what we choose, determine, determines the revenues, and then it's a little chicken and egg. Um, the retail, same comment as last week on Cal Avenue. Thank you, Kylie. Um, same comment as on the um, Cal Avenue area, parking garage. Um, edge retail, I mean, you mentioned 1,500 square feet or even less than that, you know, per building. But, I mean, I think it seems to me that, you know, having just the parking garage directly across from the post office is really doing a disservice to that. So I'll ask that question is once, it's like, so, edge retail, just small, small scale retail as one. And then also um, the height of this, um, 
you know, I'm, as I'm sure everybody here is, uh, the buildings along Waverly are one and two story. And except for the AT&T building next door, everything else along Hamilton in that block there is also one and two story. So how is, I think the staff made a comment contrary to that earlier about Hamilton. So what are you comparing to, please? And the post office is like a one and a half story. Uh, I think I was referring to the setback along Hamilton when I was saying that what we were proposing was similar to other buildings. So has there been any consideration of how this, um, this garage would or would not satisfy the um, downtown urban design guidelines or the ARB findings? Uh, I'd say not yet because design of the garage hasn't actually started. We're still, I mean, we started with the concept which that was in the feasibility study that was looked at by the council in, in 2014 which envisioned this um, five story with about this height. Um, now we're looking to finalize the program and then we're gonna move into the design. So thus far, all we've done is, is kind of look at the, at the constraints and potential layouts, approximate costs and numbers of spaces. I, I would just add quickly like, you know, mass and scale height transitions, all of that are part of, so it seems like Early on, there's some issues identified. Yeah, we'll, we'll be sure to look at that. And, and I would say, you know, there's immediate adjacency and then there's the visual um, uh, adjacency. And if we look at something like Bryant Street, I mean, we have a similar situation with the uh, Avenidas right across the street from the Bryant Street garage right to the north. We've got uh, the two story at most, you know, um, uh, athletic facility and that sort of thing. So, I mean, some some comparisons we could be thinking about not saying that that's how the determination is made but so uh council member dubois you didn't speak so um so did you guys did you do any assessment of the impact on the downtown retailers well paid parking street parking so the intercept survey process included some discussions with uh, business owners. We also had representation from retail uh, office and other business uh, uh, operations on our stakeholder committee. But I think you know one of the key recommendations from this report is that this be a, a dynamic uh, program. So that if, you know, I think we would continue to monitor sales tax receipts, occupancy, um, any kind of indicators that might uh, lead us to believe that the paid parking is negatively impacting downtown and then we would come back to you and make adjustments to pricing okay. and uh, policies related to that. And uh, can you, um, what are the maintenance operational costs of uh, single meters compared to pay stations? So there's obviously more single space meters, so there's more equipment to be touched. But I would say that it's fairly comparable in regards to the way that the upkeep and the warranty services that are provided. There's a substantial um, RMA process that goes along with both the single space and multi-space meters. And so right now, um, when I would talk about that, there would be a resource that would be required on the city's side, whether it be outsourced or insourced, that would go out and basically support the ongoing preventative maintenance support but services. But equitably, I'd say it's, re it's relatively about the same. You're saying comparable cost per unit? No, 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 just in terms of just the overall cost from the maintenance staff. There's more units to be touched, but I will yeah. say that looking at the actual maintenance exact specific costs, I don't have the details here in front of me today, but I will say that there's absolutely, if you end up going all single space, there's more equipment to be maintained. So, yeah. but in terms of comparable costs for the parts and pieces associated with it, I would say that that's when you're really looking at the spare parts and the pieces that go along with it for repair but the warranty prices that are tied into the equipment that was when we talked about the 1.2 million, et cetera, that yeah. incorporates the cost for the standard warranty, which is usually on um, three okay. years. And I'm, I'm wondering if there would be major cost savings if we upgraded the Cal Lab permit selling process and enforcement technology websites. I mean, there's some of these tools, you know, if we looked at them both at the same time, would we save a lot of money doing that? So our intent is to conduct a similar study with the Cal, uh, for the Calab Business District after this one is completed. Um, and all of the 
the comprehensive permit management system, uh, the parking technology, uh, the enforcement, all of the recommendations from this would be uh, implemented in a way that they could be rolled out in Cal Ave okay. as well. I mean, I hope we could do it quicker and cheaper since hopefully we'll learn from this one. I mean, this took like two years to get to us. Um, so hope we're not starting over with a new study or anything like that. Um, and there's the bell. All right. <laughs> Sorry. It goes fast. It does go fast. All right. Briefly. Um, when, when you talked briefly about how we sell our permits um, in the garage and you talked about how people just buy it because it's so cheap, but we don't sell one-to-one -one permit, we sell more than that. Did you take that into account? So right now, because we don't have the automated monitoring system of, you know, both garage occupancy, uh, permit holder occupancy. It's more of an art form, quite frankly. So uh, we try to anticipate how many permit holders are gonna show up at a given time. We can't oversell permits because the worst thing that could happen is a permit holder shows up and there's no permit spaces available. So um, we do typically sell more physical permits than there are spaces for a garage, but you know, the ratio varies by garage and by lot, and it's to date been more of an art form, and we wanna get much more scientific about that and help get some of those garage permit occupancy rates up and um, the automated parking guidance system coupled with parks and a more dynamic permit sales system that would allow us to sell things like weekly, monthly, quarterly permits, I think would help us get that occupancy rate much higher. So I completely get the whole garage issue and moving people into the garage. And that seems to me that that's a garage permitting issue in terms of what we sell those permits for and, and whether or not you have low income permits and you go through that. I'm trying to understand how that relates to going to, because we have, how that relates to the, having the meters as opposed to a system in which you park for two hours free in a spot or you could put 30 minutes along, you know, um, University Avenue or why did you come up with a meter and what are you trying to achieve by that? Sure. So typically if you're looking at the, let's just say all parking was free in downtown, we'll just start with the simple model. But it's model. not. No, I was just going to say what you typically would start with is you would charge for on-street parking before you would charge for off-street parking. If you were talking about a clear blank template, the first place you do is you charge for on-street because the value, the commodity is the on-street space. To be able to park in front of the coffee shop or in front of the restaurant, that's the commodity, that's where you charge, that's where you start the model at. So when you start to talk about the fact that you already currently have permit parking off-street where your people are paying for that service or for that asset, and now we're talking about being able to try to encourage the folks that are currently taking advantage of your current color zone solution where you have the time zones, you, there's a value to that parking space. And so to start to charge for parking, whatever that rate may be, it might start out at a lower threshold, higher threshold, pay to stay, whatever the model right, but is. But what are we trying to achieve with that? Because right now you can only stay two hours in most of those, there's some three. I think on-street parking is all two hours, right? Two hours for the color yeah. zones. So you're actually trying to encourage the turnover and the transitions. You want to be able to, when I was talking about the 85th percentile, you want to try to always have one to one, two spaces per block face that are always available. That's basically the ultimate goal. So by being able to establish what rate structure you have, it's to encourage that vehicle turnover and the people that want to stay for a longer term go and park in the garages or on the surface lots. That's really the ultimate goal. Okay. Um, now we're going to go to the public. Do we have any cards? So we have nine speakers. You'll each have three minutes. And our first speaker is Emily Scharf to be followed by Grant Dasher. Uh -huh. Her last name is so familiar. <laughs> no relation. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, council members. And thank you for all of the work that you guys and you guys have all been doing on the parking issue. Because we all know that parking downtown is a large problem. However, I don't think that the solution to parking is to degrade the quality of our current downtown, which I think that causing paid parking would do. Um, and I think that a lot of citizens agree with this. 
Uh, the surveys that you discussed in from the parking management study showed that most citizens were opposed to paid parking as a solution. And I think that this is for two reasons mainly. Either one, it does as the desired opportunity and opens up more parking spaces. But since parking hasn't been added, if it's opening up more parking spaces, this means that the cars are going somewhere else, either into the resident neighborhoods and causing more congestion there and really negatively impacting the residents there, or to other local areas such as Stanford Shopping Center, Mountain View, Menlo Park, Town and Country. And that would negatively impact both the shopkeepers and show that the residents aren't happy with our downtown. Now, on the other hand, if it doesn't change the amount of cars who are going to downtown, that implies that we haven't solved the parking issue and we've only caused a burden to the citizens who now have to deal with paying for parking, the inconvenience of doing the meter itself, and the change to the feel of downtown, the aesthetic change, and the fact that it feels less friendly, less homey, uh, closer to being a big city than what we currently have. Uh, for those reasons, I would say that I think we should look at a lot of the other proposed alternatives. I enjoy the idea of the wayfinding or what Tanaka was discussing in having the first two hours free. And I think that there's a lot of alternatives that we can discuss that would cause a solution to the issue of too many cars rather than uh, working instead just for added revenue or some other reason that you might be implementing paid parking. Thank you. Thank you. Grant Dasher to be followed by Stephanie Munoz. Um, hello. Uh, so I, I just wanted to appreciate the really interesting presentation that, uh, that we saw. I, I certainly don't know a ton about this particular topic, and I was really impressed with the amount of analysis that the, the staff and the consultant put into it, so it was very informative. Um, I think this is an interesting topic for me. Uh, I think at the end of the day I would support paid parking in downtown. I, I live about four miles from downtown and so I am kind of one of those people who could bike and sometimes does bike downtown but also sometimes drive when I'm lazy and I'm pretty sure at least for me what would happen is that I would bike instead of driving. So, so if other people would behave similarly I think you know it would achieve the reasonable policy goal of reducing the amount of traffic downtown. The problem is I, I don't really know if that's a knowable outcome. And so I, I would really encourage um, a significant amount of flexibility here. I mean, one of the problems is you have to make such a substantial capital investment in order to be able to really do the kind of dynamic pricing that you would want to do. But I do think it's probably worth it at the end of the day to put in place the infrastructure that would let us, you know, actually have the ability to put a price on parking in downtown and then we can ratchet that up and down. I would want to strongly encourage uh, the council if we do go with paid parking, which again I, I think is the, the right solution because we know that people respond to incentives and creating you know, incentives for behavior is the best policy tool we have to influence behavior. I'm not going to repeat. Econ 101, because uh, I think everyone here is very knowledgeable about those issues. But um, I would say I would strongly encourage flexibility and you know continually monitoring the behavior, relaxing prices in times of low demand, uh, certainly making sure that you take things other than coins. This is one of my big gripes whenever I go to Redwood City is I always forget to bring coins with me. And so I think it's absolutely critical that it be trivial to pay if we do this kind of thing. It's not about the cost for me, it's about the convenience. Um, I think, and I also think it's really important to take a comprehensive approach to parking and try and look at things in the perspective of where do you want <coughs> cars of certain sorts to go. So distinguishing between the, the sort of business community that we have that leaves at five or six every day and we have certain goals with parking during the day, but we have very different goals for the people who are coming to dinner and like me who like lives here and works in a different city uh, and trying to sort of adapt the parking to to, to deal with those different goals. And so I think, in, I think if we had a dynamic sort of agile parking program that we could review constantly uh, and solicit a lot of community involvement, I think the sort of capital investments to get our city in such a situation would be worth it um, and would achieve a lot of the concerns that I think I share about, you know, making sure that we don't disincentivize people for for, for coming downtown. We just change the mode in which they commute if that's possible. Thanks. 
Thank you. Stephanie Munoz to be followed by Bob Moss. Thanks again, Mayor Sharp. The thrust of the City Council's efforts and regulation of the land use is always to make the land more valuable, also more expensive. By giving more, a greater proportion of, every time you give a greater proportion of land to job creation and commerce, rather you make the remaining land you available for residents and all other uses more valuable and harder to get, which means that when you want to have a piece of land for public use or a publicly desired private use, you're bidding against yourselves. You're, you're bidding up a price that you have raised because of, of um, giving value to these other, pri to these other um, uh, uses. Uh, the, we recently passed, astonishingly, a big bond issue for affordable housing. Now, uh, this, ho this use of land has been an issue for a number of years now. The state has mandated that the city have sites nominated to be for housing, even if they don't use them, even if they never use them, they have to have these sites. And I have a hunch that some of these parking places are in that little, uh, are, are in that enclave of, of, uh, of um, uh, mandated housing um, designations. I would like to suggest, in as much as you have decided against, well, not exactly against, but you have pr prioritized the, par the housing of cars over the housing of people, yeah, that there is a way, I see, that you can have your cake and eat it too. There are a large number of people in this community <coughs> who are very ingenious, and they have made up little houses for themselves that roll on wheels and can be moved from place to place. They're called cars. Almost everybody owns one, even people who don't have houses. And I think I would like to insist, small that I am, but I think the town will insist that you make this, these parking places available at night so that people who have no homes can park their cars there, paying for the parking, why not? And they must have toilets on every floor. And I think you should consider very seriously having showers also. And keeping in mind, too, that you are thinking ahead toward possible disasters in which you will need, a, like San Jose with its floods. So, a, a little you. car housing in those garages, please. Toilets. Thank you. Bob Moss to be followed by Peter Stone. Thank you, Mayor Sharp and Council Members. Uh, let me be blunt. The idea of having parking charges downtown sucks. Been there, then that, lousy results. You may not have been here, I'm sure none of you have been here 45, 50 years ago when we had parking meters downtown. And four or five o'clock in the evening, downtown was a desert. People didn't come here to shop or to go to restaurants. They went to Stanford Research Park, or Stanford uh, Shopping Center, pardon me. They went to Menlo Park, even up to East Palo Alto. So if you charge for parking, you're telling me that when I come to a city council meeting, it's gonna cost me $4.50 to $6 to park in the garage downtown, downstairs, and come to this meeting. You should be paying me, I shouldn't be paying you. I think you'll find if you put this non-competitive parking fee in, they don't charge for parking in downtown Mountain View, downtown Menlo Park, Los Altos, East Palo Alto. So all of the business is going to flow away and you're gonna have a lot of people looking for where they're going to shop 
and you have a lot of business owners and small store owners hurting badly. It's a lousy idea. We did it before. It hurt the city. It hurt the economy. It's going to be bad for business. Don't do it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter Stone. Mayor Scharf, who briefly disappeared, and council members, good evening. He'll be back. I'm sure he will. Um, speaking on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, I'll be talking about this major infrastructure uh, move that we're making here with the downtown garage. Um, of all the parking problems we have, the one that's felt, I think, most acutely by business these days is the need for greater employee permit parking, uh, which a garage is, should be, I think, primarily designed to address because we obviously want the, and expect the shoppers, for the most part, to be on the streets. Um, some use of off-street, but uh, more use of the streets. We don't want our employees parking on the streets, if at all possible. To the, we want to minimize that, but of course, at present, although the garage occupancy apparently is not as high as most of us might have thought with, if we didn't have the data, um, there are still uh, permit waiting lists for every garage. There's not enough permits available. So what I would like to urge is that we, uh, we don't get that many opportunities to build a new garage uh, in a major piece of infrastructure like this. Let's really maximize the parking. Uh, I think we would, we would like actually to see the basement option and find a way to fund it. Uh, to the extent that we can take a deeper dive into the world of mechanical uh, technology enhanced parking and perhaps uh, uh, I recognize the, the result that the staff study so far has generated. I, I think there's, there's a lot of technology out there. I hope we're looking uh, pretty deeply at that as a way, another way to make the, this piece of infrastructure more productive um, in terms of uh, the amount of parking that it uh, involves. Um, and then my, my final comment, not on the, the, uh, the garage, goes to the other parts of the parking program, and that is um, I guess I'm not terribly worried about uh, uh, the effect of paid parking. When I look at uh, Redwood City and Mountain View, they seem to be doing quite fine in their downtowns with, with paid parking. I uh, haven't seen stats, so I can't say that that's fact-based. Uh, what I'm looking for is to see some paid parking revenue flowing into uh, the TMA and uh, trip reduction, which I think long-term is going to be the best, uh, the best way to make sure that these problems get better and not worse. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Amy Ashton. Good evening. I just also wanted to speak in support of the paid parking program for downtown. It supports the aggressive goals within our city's SCAP. And as a cyclist, I'm excited to see a potential revenue source for TDM and TMA programs in the city. Um, that's a lot of acronyms to say that I support programs that seek to decrease vehicle use overall and facilitate transit and cycling. I can almost almost swallow the idea of the cost and, and impact of a giant parking garage in downtown if I knew that potential revenues would go to decreasing trips overall and generating a more livable, vibrant downtown. So thank you. Thank you. Rita Burrell to be followed by Wendy Sylvain. Um, hello. So Hamilton Hitchings wanted me to say a little bit for him. Um, he wanted me to say we have uh, 15 100 parking spaces and deficit downtown, so he strongly supports option C. He does not think adding more retail space to lot D is the best use of that space. On the second topic of uh, downtown parking, he wanted uh, to say oh, that we used to have parking meters downtown, but they were taken out because they were hurting local merchants. Uh, not only will paid uh, two-hour parking hurt merchants, it will also have a negative effect for local residents who want to visit downtown merchants or to run an errand. Eliminate the color zones and make in the entire downtown one color zone to stop shop uh, spot hoppers. Provide digital readouts of spaces available in garages. Move full-day permit holders to garages and not have, allow them to occupy the uh, street parking which should be used for our customers of local businesses. Build the garage on lot D and maximize the spots. 
uh, by adding the basement. Um, he understands that the city wants additional revenue to fund the TMA, but there are other ways to get it that do not penalize merchants. Um, that said, I think downtown paid parking is great. Having worked in San Francisco and knowing that it was $24 for uh, three hours and 20 minutes and more, and then having seen the uproar when Stanford Hospital put in their parking garage at Blake Wilbur, and it was so wonderful to be able to find parking. I don't go downtown because there's not parking. Uh, so I think charging a minimal fee uh, would be great. I think it would also, like Miss Julie said, which was a fantastic presentation, thank you. Um, it will encourage people to go and stay in the garages rather than occupying uh, the street. Uh, the street. The other thing is that once again, I think having to build this garage shows that um, office buildings were underparked, and I hope that there's some way to encourage buildings to pay their fair share and to park for their occupants. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Sylvain to be followed by Lane One. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Wendy Silvani for the TMA, and we were part of the uh, stakeholder group working with Dixon Associates, and we totally support the notion of paid parking for downtown. It, as you've heard many times, it supports the TMA goals um, and our programs, and it really <coughs> provides an important framework <coughs> for the community to come together and start taking TDM um, very seriously and make it more effective. Um, I think there's some, you know, refinement things that still need to be worked out. Um, a couple of them that I'll just toss into the, the basket is establishing spaces for people who are carpooling, that we're trying to encourage people to carpool, and those occasional users who need to drive who are ordinarily on <coughs> transit. Um, and so we'll look forward to working with the consultants on the next phase to make this a reality. And just as a little side note, we have 86 people right now that we are buying transit passes for, and on their applications to our program, we ask them where they're currently parking. We're only offering the passes right now to people who currently drive alone without exception, they're parking on the street. So that's, of your 300, Julie, 86 of them are already in our program. So I think that kind of speaks to what we're all trying to do collectively and how it all integrates. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine Wong. Good evening. I just wanted to talk to the um, the parking study, not the garage. I didn't realize we were combining the two. Um, I support all of the comments um, earlier about using um, paid parking to help fund TMA and to support the badly needed transit um, transportation demand management that we need in our city. Um, I think sustainable transportation is, again, the cornerstone of everything that we're doing. You've got a really good three-legged stool of managing parking, um, talking about supply and re re reducing demand, and that's going to be the, the, the way that we reduce future demand going forward and to meet all of our um, sustainability goals. I'd like to um, just sort of emphasize a couple of things. I'm actually a little bit concerned. Um, this goes to the, the discussion about how underutilized the garages are. I think we need, uh, I hope that you'll consider additional flexibility for any sort of permit types that exist out there. Um, in addition to the hourly parking, I think people, the nature of work is changing. People aren't working here all eight, eight, nine to five for years and years and years at a time. People are coming here on a daily basis. They, need, um, they might need weekly permits. They might need monthly permits. I really emphasize the sort of short-term aspect of work that um, people are coming into our downtown for. These are like small contractors, um, uh, project-based uh, consultants, um, even like short-term construction workers, like solar installers and things like that. We really need to make provisions for them so that there's flexibility for people um, and that we can really use those garage spaces um, much better than we are currently. Um, and again, the, the issue of, um, I'm really concerned, I served on the RPP um, 
stakeholder group, and I'm, I'm seeing now the effects of that, and really the service and the retail workers are the ones who have been um, highly inconvenienced by the RPP. And so I would also hope that in this discussion, there's some, discuss there's some provisions made um, either whether that's outreach, you know, such as Wendy has been doing already, um, to ensure that they know what their options are. I think that they don't know, um, and I think we just also need to think holistically what um, happens, you know, when when paid parking, if it does go forward, what is going to happen to the RPP permit? We need to price those in a way that the core parking spaces are convenient, flexible, the best options, so that we don't have um, neighborhood spillover parking. Um, going forward with, with any paid parking provisions. Thanks. Thank you. And now we return to council. And I think the first thing we should do is take up the, um, the parking garage. So I am just going to turn it over to council to talk about the parking garage and then we'll come back. Um, council Member Du Bois. So I was confused about one piece. The drawings all show a potential second entrance to the alley, but then I think the report says that, that would not be there. Um, can you clarify, you know, is there a second entrance on, in this garage? So there actually would be a second entrance in the alley between the proposed garage and where CVS is now. I think the staff report referred to a second entrance off of Waverly that the, so feasibility, the, city, the feasibility study considered, but we felt was too close to the intersection of Waverly and Hamilton. Isn't that where the alley connects out to Waverly? Yes, it does. It does start from Waverly. You go Waverly West towards Bryant. So you would turn. You would drive from Waverly to the back of the garage, or, or not? I don't think a lot of people would actually do that. I think it would be more of a, a possible exit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Still a little confused on that one. <laughs> uh, so I do think it'd be useful to see kind of the revenue offset from the retail space. You know, when you look at the cost per parking space, if there's revenue being generated, it would, it would hopefully offset some of that. Um, I don't really see a need for a large indoor bike parking space. And uh, I, I would consider, you know, maybe outdoor bike parking and potentially keeping a public restroom. I'm a little concerned that we're losing one of our few public restroom facilities. Um, was there any thought about moving that existing automated bathroom to another lot or post office or some other location? We, we've talked about the potential of doing that, but haven't started looking at where the location could, could be yet. Okay. Um, so personally, um, I, I value the retail space. I think it's community building. I think that street could use it. Uh, there's some you know, prolific oven, some well-loved stores there, and some additional retail would be a positive. And again, I'm also concerned about the loss of a public restroom. Um, so, you know, I, I'm pretty flexible on this one. I, I liked option B because of the retail. We didn't hear a lot about uh, our infrastructure budget and what where this puts us if we go underground versus, so the one thing I would say is I just, I don't think we can, go with a Cadillac version on every single infrastructure project. So we should really think about ones where we want to spend extra money and ones where we want to save a little money. So I would tend to favor B, but I could be talked into going underground if that's what people are in favor of. Mr. Mayor, if I could just very quickly say that the infrastructure plan numbers that we have shared with the council, including the sort of gap that we have right now, <laughs> Um, we have option B essentially as the downtown parking garage price that is in that number there. Thank you. Um, see, Council Member Ness. Well, with that great lead, Council Member Du Bois, I am going to make a motion that uh, recommends the staff recommendation, which is on page one, to proceed with the full preliminary design and environmental review on a new 291 space parking garage concept with five levels of above ground and a 3,800 square foot retail space with one uh, addition. I would suggest that we include the underground basement and uh, I will not include the puzzle lift on this one, but um, I would like to see the underground basement. I would second that. Thanks. Council, Vice Mayor Ness, would you like to speak to your motion? 
Yes, and I, I would like to speak to it because I know um, we talked a little about the, you know, how, how high this might be. Are there other garages like that? And um, uh, I may have missed one, but apparently Alma Street and Cowper Webster both are at that, at that height. I, I have a request in the future. It would be such a help if you included elevations with these in addition, in addition to the flat um, architectural view that you give us. It, it, it helps me, everyone may not need elevations, but for some reason, if you can see what the, how, how they look in relation to the other buildings, I think that, that makes a big difference. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the bathroom as well, Tom, but I don't know how well used that is. I've, I've, um, I've never seen anyone go in and out of the, what is, which was called at that point a French bathroom. And, um, but do any of you know how used it is? Is it something we should try to accommodate? Uh, we can. Uh, we don't have that uh, handy, but we can look into that and get that information to the council, mm -hmm. both as part of relocation. You know, the efficacy of relocation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, and I'm glad we took both these up tonight because I think they really play into each other. We're talking about um, supply, as uh, Elaine Wong just mentioned. This is this is more supply, pretty substantial supply. Um, at the same time, I know that we'll probably hear something from stores in that area about, about access. And so I would like us to make sure we have some way of getting through that, through that alley type of space and around to CVS and some of the other stores that are there. I think the more, the more able we are to crisscross in the downtown, the more walkable the downtown becomes. So um, I don't think I can add much to that, and um, I'll stop there. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Could we suggest a small change to the motion, and that's based on the comment that Brad made since the staff report that the retail probably should be smaller. So even if you just said up to 3,800 square feet and then Accepted. We, okay. Fine. Yes, and we discussed that as well and said maybe that's just too much. We want some retail, but maybe it doesn't need to be almost 4,000 square feet. I'll, I'll just speak real quickly since I already spoke. I, I would like to keep it up to 38, and before we reduce it, I'd really like us to go back and see if we couldn't have a larger retail there. Um, I know you said we could go underground with retail, um, so I don't know what we lose for the additional ramps. I mean, there's more ramps clearly when you go up and down, right? Um, but I don't know if uh, Council Member Niss would accept an amendment to just um, have staff consider a public restroom there and come back and let us know if that's feasible. Yes, and that was yeah. why I, I had asked, you know, how, how well used is that? And I, yeah. I simply don't know. Yeah, so again, I, I just, I, before we just shrink the, the retail base on what we've heard so far, I'd just like us to continue to investigate that. Council Member Niss, can I make one comment? If, if your motion is adding the basement, then we probably should adjust the 291 space, yes, which please. is based on. Yes, I should have so done I, that. I would exactly. suggest 339 spaces, I think, is right. the approximate number we'd be looking at. Thank, thank you for mentioning that. Okay, Council Member Walbach. I'll be supporting the motion, and just to speak to it briefly. Um, we heard from the consultant about the number of cars still playing the hopscotch or the two-hour shuffle, as we sometimes call it. Um, and what we heard was that it's about 300 cars. Here's a garage to give those cars somewhere to go. So I, I think this is really heading the right direction and an important part of solving the puzzle. Councilmember Holman. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, a couple of questions. Um, does the motion um, allow staff the flexibility? Is it the intention of the maker and seconder, the up to 3,800 square feet of retail space, that one of the things you could look at is um, edge retail as opposed to retail just on Waverly? Is that is that I, agreeable I have to no the maker trouble and with that, but but let's ask staff whether or not that 
that can be accomplished or is it going to, because I know your design isn't completely done yet. So the question is, can that be done or is that going to compromise the design? The design's not done, but I think we'll ask Michelle, our consultant from Watry, okay, to help thanks. us with that question. Good evening, Michelle Wendler with Watry Design. It's not impossible to do edge retail along Hamilton. It's more difficult than doing the edge uh, retail on the, on the Waverly Street side based on the structural system that we have in the building. Um, that's the direction that the beams frame into. So if you look at a parking garage and you look up and the beams are coming across, um, that is reducing the head height clearance. It's much easier to um, fix that on the Waverly Street side than it is to do that on the Hamilton Street side. So it has a more impact to the structural system to do it on the Hamilton Street side as well. So you're impacting more of the garage footprint by doing it that way. And so it has a higher cost per square foot overall. And again, we're just talking edge retail. We're talking edge retail, but to make it feasible, the clearance for a parking structure is only eight and a half feet underneath the beams. And so that's generally not that accommodating for retail space, even if it's about 1,500 square feet. So trying to work with that, there's not room for ducting and things like that that need to happen in that space. So it's possible when it's been done on other structures, but the cost is, is more to do it there. Yeah, so uh, Karen, I, I appreciate the thought, but I, I think I wouldn't incorporate that into the motion. Okay, and then question for staff. Um, question for staff, so um, with the council going forward with this now, and, it's, and I'm not quite sure how the number 339 parking space garage came about because it's not the option that's on the screen is not any of the options here so I don't know how you came up with that number so quickly it's essentially the spaces from option B plus the difference between option C and A so question so if the council goes ahead with this motion I mean sort of generally I support it but if the council goes ahead with this motion are we tying the hands of the ARB by saying we're going to accomplish a 339 space parking garage and hang the ARB findings and hang the uh, downtown urban design guides? So that's my question. Are we just saying to the ARB, this is what we're going to do? That's not how we view it. I mean, we're trying to define the outline of the program that we would begin design with and take to the ARB and then um, the project will be subject to the ARB's full review. With no constraints on their role. Well, uh, is, I must have missed something while I was out. I mean, is the staff proposing to constrain the role of the ARB? I don't think that's our purview. Well, the reason I ask is because we are prescribing a 339 parking space garage and that has parameters that are very clearly described in the presentation. So that's why I raised the question is like, are we constraining them because of what we're prescribing? That's what raises the question. Well, I wouldn't presume that we're prescribing them, but wouldn't the inverse also be true that we, if we prescribed what we were gonna present to the ARB, they wouldn't be able to look at what it was we actually wanted. I mean, we've got to take what we've got as a concept to the ARB. I'm but sure if they have, I'm sure they're gonna comment on the project, don't you, and recommend changes and design I, or whatever? I don't know, because I've seen instances in the past, the reason, I mean, it really is a serious issue for me, and I think it's gonna be for the public, because I have seen instances in the past where at both Planning Commission and the ARB where they have felt like the council has decided what it wants and so it isn't what I would do. I'm just saying, you know, what AR, I've heard ARB members say is like, what well, isn't what I would do and I wish we could do this, but the council said what they want. So they do feel like their hands are tied and that's why I want to get real clarity on this. Well, then, then that, I mean, under that description, I'm, 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 I'm not comfortable commenting on that. I mean, there's a lot of variable factors there. I mean, the council is making a recommendation to the ARB. You know, I mean, I can't speak for why somebody on the ARB feels the way they might feel when we take something from the council. 
So would the maker and second of the motion um, uh, accept an amendment that would be um, um, that the council that the council motion is a um, um, is to describe desired outcomes, but is not intended to uh, limit the ARB purview. That's probably a bit of overkill. Um, if you want to make an amendment, we vote on it, fine. But I, I don't think I'd include that in the motion. I, I don't recall us doing that in in other contexts. So I, I don't think I I find that that's really acceptable tonight. So is there a second? Okay, I'll remember what staff said and we'll see how, how it goes. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I wouldn't take that to the <laughs> bank either, what the staff <laughs> said, really. So the intention is not to, not to handcuff the ARB, that's what I heard. And not to handcuff the city council either. Both of those. I don't think we're handcuffing the city council, but um, the desire is to say, well, this is what the council wants, sort of. But if you think differently, you you would prevail. I mean, I think there is a dialogue that takes place between the council and the ARB in this case in this process. And why don't we trust that? I, I'm, that's what I'm looking for is the dialogue. So. Um, I don't have any other. I don't have any other comments. Okay, briefly, I'd like to um, say that I'm going to support the motion. I think it's. Um, well, now you put your light on. Now you put your light on. Now you put your light on. I'm just going to let Phil Seth speak, and then I'm going to let Tanaka speak. <laughs> yeah, just briefly. I think, you know, we're sort of, we're, we're sort of working our way towards the culmination of a process that's been going on a long time. And, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, I think the, the genesis of the parking problem, a lot of it came from maybe the city wasn't keeping up quite as fast with employment trends downtown and codes and so forth. And as a result, you know, we sort of got to this point and now we're, we're working through the, the, the solution to that. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to put up this building and you know, as you go and walk around that area, there's basically one place that you can see it from, right? Which is if you walk down the west side of Waverly Avenue, right now when you walk down there, what you look at and you look across that open parking parking lot and you see that beautiful Burge Clark building across the street, the post office behind some trees on one side and the church on the other side. After we build this, you're not gonna see that from there, okay? You're gonna see this big concrete thing. Okay, that's about the only place you're going to be able to see it from. You can't see it from downtown. You can't see it from the other side of Waverly. So that view is what we're going to lose for. That's the price we're going to pay for, for doing all this. Okay. A couple of years ago, the council cleaned up a lot of the exemptions that allowed people to put up buildings that didn't have enough parking for their tenants. But we haven't finished yet. And we're still putting up buildings like that. So if you look at 429 University, which we approved a couple years ago or a couple months ago, okay, our codes say that building is fully parked, okay, even though everybody here knows it isn't, okay. If we don't finish the job and clean up this stuff, okay, so that we have a, a real balance, we're going to be back here some year in the future having the same discussion again, right. So I hope that as we do the comprehensive parking plan, we go back and we gotta look, we gotta go back and look at the source of the problem and make sure we're not digging the hole deeper. Sorry. Councilmember Tanaka. So I'm, I'm also gonna support this motion. I think uh, parking is badly needed in this area. Um, but I, I think one thing we wanna consider is that in downtown, there's really not much land left for parking. Um, and so we're, we're um, this is a very scarce resource and I think, you know, maybe in a decade or so, we'll probably regret actually not putting another level of parking in here. So what I want us to consider is what we did on Cal Ave. On Cal Ave, we actually had two levels of basement parking. Um, in downtown, parking is even more scarce. Um, we have even 
uh, less opportunity to build parking. And so I, I think we should, um, we should actually, instead of going for one level of basement parking, I want to make a friendly amendment for us to, to do two levels of basement parking. So I'm looking for the maker of the motion. And, and normally I'd be delighted with that, but I'd, I, I'm worried tonight that we've already upped the price, I think about three million. And um, as I recall from last week, that puts it up to four million. So I'm, I'm not comfortable with that, Council Member Tanaka, I'm sorry. Once again, if you want to make it a separate amendment, but I, I'd rather not add it to the main motion. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. No. Okay. Um, I'm going to make another one, which, which will probably not succeed, but we'll see, which is um, I, I think while staff looked at puzzle lists, there's so many other parking technologies out there that can really increase the efficiency of parking. And... I think there's also another lost opportunity for us not to really try to pack cars in here. I think this could be the lot that um, would provide a lot of employee parking, especially for the low wage workers. Um, you know, we, we are, I, I didn't do calculation for this garage, but on the Cal Ave garage, we only get about 11% volume efficiency. That means only 11% only of the volume in the garage in Cal Ave that we proved, um, I think it was a few weeks ago, um, is cars. And, um, and there's so many other ways to get a 2x up to a 5x increase in parking uh, with the same volume. And given that land is so scarce here and so valuable that I think we should, um, what I would like to say is not direct staff necessarily, but to uh, have them analyze to see if, see if it's possible to do it. Um, so I um, wanted to see if this might be a friendly amendment for staff to explore this option. I'm fine with that. Are you, Tom, or not? So I think um, I think we heard staff say they kind of looked at it. Uh, the um, and I heard a lot of discussion about flexibility between short-term parking, long-term parking, which is attractive. Um, I mean, I, I'll go ahead and support having them do additional analysis. But uh, I did I did like what I heard about the flexibility of being able to use it for different uses. I'm, I'm in particular I'm interested in whether or not it could be in the basement because that's one of the things that I, I heard about before. I, I just I, I appreciate that, um, Councilmember Tanaka, because I don't want us to rule that out. And I think if we indicate this is to analyze it, you're not directed to do anything. We're just asking you to look at the possibilities. So might I ask, Mr. Mayor, um, Brad, can you just sort of weigh in on sort of the implications of the direction as you're hearing it? Uh, it's, it's just a little unclear to me uh, what sort of analysis we're being asked for. So if the direction is to go look and, sit and see are there cost-effective ways to add some more parking um, using lifts like we talked about earlier or, or similar technologies that we might not have, have looked at, um, I think that's very doable. Um, if the direction is to step back and say, okay, um, how are the ways that we could fully maximize parking on this site with a completely automated um, approach? We've discussed that a little given discussions we had last week, and it looks like that would require probably a new RFP process that, that would essentially restart the project. I, I think what you suggested first is sufficient. I think we want to look at this in such a way as to see, you know, I, I know that there are several places downtown that are actually using the puzzle in, in small ways, and I think that's the kind of thing we should look at. I'm not suggesting you completely revamp the entire garage, but look at, particularly you mentioned in the basement, you might be able to do something yeah. like that. I, I wouldn't support restarting the RFP, so if you can do it under the current RFP, maybe we could clarify that, just say analyze it under the current RFP. Sure. Or why don't you say without causing any delay to the process? <laughs> something okay. like that. Yeah. So I think the staff is comfortable <coughs> then with that as the, as the direct. Is that going to work? Good. Okay, thanks. Anything further, Councilmember Tanaka? No. All right, seeing no other lights, I'll just speak briefly to it. Um, 
I am going to support the motion. I appreciate it. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the retail here, and, and I, I think for this helps council a little bit too. It says 3,800 square feet of retail. Retail, at least in downtown Palo Alto, I believe is always triple net. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen it re not be triple net currently. And, you know, there might be a few spaces that aren't, but that's the market for new retail. So it's really easy to work out how much revenue is going to make. You could say, if it's $3.50 a square foot, you multiply that by, you know, by the amount of the square foot, 3,800, you multiply it by 12. If you think it's $4 a square foot, if you think it's $5 a square foot. Um, it's actually really simple. And then if you want to get the value, you cap it out. And, you know, it's probably somewhere between, Hamid recently thought it was a five cap. I probably think it's somewhere between a five and a six cap. So, you know, you can do the math yourself as to what that's worth. It's, it's fairly simple. I, I think when we look at this, I do think we want to decide what we as a city want to do with 3,800 3, square feet of retail. I personally think we should sell it. I don't think I want to be in the business of leasing 3,800 square feet of retail, frankly, and as a city and having any political of who we lease it to, who we don't, how that works. So I at least want the, the legal department to look at how we would condominiumize this particular piece of property, if that's possible, or how that would work. Um, you know, is that something you'd like in the motion, or are you going to do it anyway? Or, I mean, I'm happy. I figured you'd do it anyway, and I, I didn't want to make any decisions about what we do with it tonight, but I wanted to make sure when it came back to us, we had options. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I would definitely encourage us. It's not a matter if I want big retail or, or small retail in my mind, you know, 1,500 or 3,800. I think we need to look at what is the market there and what we're trying to achieve. Big retail, which probably leads more towards a restaurant, frankly, because that's what fills it. Whereas there's a certain depth retailers have that they want. Um, I just would encourage us to, to think a little bit about what those options are and what you're then building to the market and that we don't just, we don't just blithely say we want big retail, little retail, or that we, and we look at obviously how many parking spaces and that staff, you know, staff look at that carefully and, and actually maybe talk to some retail consultants or, and I'm sure you'll do that anyway. Um, so that was my, my biggest concern on this, is that we do that correctly with the retail. Um, let's see, was there anything else here? Just in hours, we can't pull it out. Delay. Yeah. Other than that, you know, I'm looking forward to this actually getting built, and I think it'll be a, a huge boon to downtown and, and helpful with some of the strategies we've talked about in terms of actually solving some of these problems. All right, now we have one quick question. Councilmember Wallbach, or one quick comment. I just wanted to uh, affiliate my views with what the mayor just said about uh, keeping options open, including the possibility of uh, selling off the retail space. And now if we could um, vote on the board. And that passes unanimously. Now coming back to, um, to the next, to the previous, or the next item, I guess it would be called. Councilmember Fine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm starting to get enough of a chance to say thank you very much for this report. I think it's quite comprehensive, touches on a lot of the issues that we're seeing in terms of problems, provides a lot of solutions, um, and also keeps options open. Um, I've got a few comments and I'll be making a motion, but I, I do want to emphasize to my colleagues, this is just one more step in moving towards this program. We're not actually buying into it. We will, will be asking staff to return with a phasing and implementation and hopefully a finance plan. Um, at its core, this really is a tragedy of the commons problem where we have limited availability of a scarce resource and we're trying to allocate it. We've been working on a lot of parking and transportation solutions and issues. We've put money down on garages, we've launched a TMA, and this is kind of the vital parking management piece that I see is needed kind of as the centerpiece to hold up these other pieces. RPP doesn't work if we have free two hour parking downtown. Our TMA doesn't have as much of an incentive. People don't have the incentive to take transit if they can park downtown for free. Um, so as I mentioned, I think overall the staff report and recommendations are excellent, um, but I think we do have a number of options down the road, whether it's single pay, whether it's uh, you know pay for per place, pay for license plate, whether we use license plate readers, things like that. Um, so I think in general this 
parking supply study will allow us to manage that supply more predictably, price and time spots dynamically, which allows us to create incentives or disincentives for different parking behaviors. Maybe we do get an hour of free parking spot in front of retailers, or maybe uh, we get folks like Bob Moss to come to city council meetings because we give out free parking downtown on council nights. These are all possibilities with a dynamic system. We can also improve enforcement through ne new technologies, which means less violations, more compliance, and if it is our policy goal, more revenue. Finally, we can create subsidies for specific purposes, whether we're transferring some of the funds to the TMA uh, or giving it out, giving out cheaper spots to nonprofits. So we just approved you know, about $60 million in new parking garages, and I think it's really important that we protect and pay for those assets. So the motion I'm going to have is essentially the staff motion with a few changes. If you could put the staff motion up for this. So it's to conduct public outreach and work with the Planning and Transportation Commission and the city's finance committee to refine recommendations related to the introduction of paid parking in downtown Palo Alto and return with a phasing, finance, and implementation plan for council's consideration of fall 2017. The next point, um, and this is kind of direction to staff, is that this effort should be highly integrated and coordinated with our RPP and with garage and permit pricing, um, just to make sure we are really looking at the full suite of, of parking options and supplies we have available to us. Thank you. Would you like to speak to your motion? Um, I'll hold off for now, but I think I have. Council Member Walbach, would you like to speak to your second? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that the important thing here is that we're not making final decisions about the details. That that's still going to, it's going to the planning commission, it's going to the finance committee. There's a lot more work that's still going to be done. Uh, but I appreciate it coming to us in this form at this point. I think this is a really useful check-in, essentially, uh, to see the kinds of directions we're going and to start, you know, raising for the council and the public to think about some of the details that we are going to have to make final decisions about later. Uh, you know, personally, I lean more towards allowing pay to stay, and I lean more towards having more uh, individual meters. You know, maybe you know, the meter with, you know, one meter for every two spots. Um, you know, others on council and consultants and others in the community may have strong arguments why they would support not having pay to stay and only having meters at the end of the block. Um, uh, and yeah, I want to make sure I've heard all of those arguments and that we fully aired those discussions before we make final determinations. I, I ask, you know, for all of us on the council and the community just to remember, that's where we're at right now. We're not making final calls on these details. I also think, it, just to continue something that uh, Council Member Fine started uh, talking about, the issue of flexibility of a, a dynamic system. If we find that the rates are too high, and that's hurting downtown businesses, or that we want to uh, you know, change the hours of operation for a parking meter, or if we want to provide, say, free or discounted parking, or maybe higher cost for parking uh, to, you know, at certain times, we'll have the flexibility to do that in a, again, a dynamic way. So even if we, once we've made some final policy determinations about what gets installed, that's not the end of the discussions about how to use those technologies. I really see this as you know, trying to move us towards future-proofing. So I, I think that's important in guiding how we think about this in the Finance Committee and the public and on the uh, PTC and also back here on councils. How do we adopt technologies and revamp our city processes to future-proof ourselves, to leave open those those tweaks that we might need to make if there's an economic downturn, if, you know, if we find something's not working. And, and that's, for me, one of the most critical things. Um, you know, uh, something I'd mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking about the garage, uh, I do think that uh, I want to highlight, you know, two-wheeled vehicles, whether it's motorcycles, scooters, electric bikes, or bicycles that use so much less parking space. Uh, you know, I, just as a quick anecdote, um, you know, I've recently you know, had to park my motorcycle in Palo Alto, in Redwood City, in San Francisco, in San Jose. San Francisco, everything is metered. You're parking your motorcycle, you're paying at a meter for a motorcycle, but it's a fractional cost 
to represent the fractional space that you need to use. Uh, I was in downtown San Jose, couldn't find designated motorcycle parking. I didn't want to take up a whole space. So I did something that, you, you, you know, it seems to be totally okay here in Palo Alto. You park on the edge where you're taking up about, you know, five inches or so or six inches of a space, especially in a big space, and that's fine. Um, uh, and San Jose, in their infinite wisdom, decided to ticket me for an expired meter uh, when I was trying to stay out of their way and not use a parking space. So I think that's, you know, uh, you know, as we look towards making it a little bit less uh, or a little bit pricier to park downtown, that we make sure that if somebody wants to take a form of transportation that doesn't take a full parking space, that we, we really want to encourage that, whether it's in our parking garages or on the street. I think we've done a pretty good job of that in Palo Alto, but I want to make sure we're continuing to think about that going forward, uh, whether it's with free spaces or, uh, or with uh, fractionally priced uh, spaces. Uh, I also think, especially with electric bikes, uh, one of the big concerns is security, right? I, and, and frankly, some non-electric bikes are pretty pricey. And uh, I think that you know, we want to think about what that means uh, especially in garages. You know, if we have, you know, the other thing about, you know, if you're on two wheels, uh, you know, whether it's myself on my motorcycle or Councilmember Tanaka on his, on his bicycle, when it's raining, we don't want to get in or out of our gear while standing in the rain. So having covered spaces in a parking garage that has a, you know, security camera, uh, you know, that's something to let people know, hey, here's a great place to, to, to park your vehicle while, where, It'll, you'll have that amenity of being covered and having security. Uh, so those are just a couple things to think about. Um, I also really want to associate, you know, at this point, just my, my inclination uh, towards having flexibility around the number of days somebody gets a permit for. Uh, just like I prefer pay to stay because I want flexibility for a number of hours in case somebody you know, you come downtown, you think you're only going to be here for a couple hours for a meeting, but you decide, you know what, I'm here. I'm going to do a little shopping and spend more of my, my tax, you know, spend more to contribute to the city's tax base. That's great. We want to encourage that and we want to make it easy for them to stay. That's one of the reasons I'm encouraged. I, I'm in favor of uh, uh, pay to stay, at least in, in some areas, um, you know, because I, I want to make it easy for people to stick around downtown and spend their hard earned money um, or to just enjoy our amenities or go to, the, go to Heritage Park. And um, uh, in the same way, having flexibility for the length of a permit. Uh, whether you know to have daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly permits, I think is really essential in uh, reducing the barriers to entry to getting a permit and getting, especially off of the street, into a garage. Thanks, <coughs> Councilmember Philseth. Hi, thanks. Um, I uh, you know. I just asked a question. Councilmember Tanaka asked this earlier, and it was about flexibility. I don't think I quite understand the answer, so I wanted, just wanted to make sure that I understood this right, which is I think the issue of whether you pay from time zero or whether there's a one-hour free parking or two-hour free parking, but maybe you pay more after that or something like that, you know, the third hour costs money or something. Uh, I suspect that one's going to get debated for a while, right? and we may be going back and forth on it for some time. Are we gonna be forced to lock ourselves into some architecture that precludes that? That is, if we go this direction, nope, you can't have any free time. If you go that one, nope, it, it has to always free. Or is it gonna be flexible enough that we can make those decisions later? Sure, so specifically to the opportunity to provide free on street then to yes. be followed by paid yes it basically becomes it's a resource nightmare because how do you manage it moving forward and how do you enforce it so it really becomes an aspect of resources the reason why we highlighted the garage is because the garage can be controlled and basically monitored by the person's access time and exit time etc <clears throat> so to tell you that you would be limited um, i think it's always up for debate and discussion and absolutely looking at the technology available that's out there i can just tell you that the technology that exists today that that type of solution is not in place that i'm aware of and i've looked at the majority of technology advancements and so um, to be able to achieve the desire, though, that you're going for, one of the items that the stakeholders did talk about 
was having available, um, you know, short stay parking on right. the block faces by being able to have 15 minute spaces and or loading zones that are convenient to the local business owners. So what I might suggest is potentially a compromise to look at the opportunity to provide those temporary parking spaces that allow people to do their quick service solutions. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest at this point, while it can be evaluated, I'm just not aware of how you can effectively or efficiently manage the solution the way that you're describing, at Got least it. with the technology available today. I understand. And I, so we're gonna have to make it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I would just add that uh, going back to Council Member Wolbach's comment about being future proof, um, you know, as we move into the, if we elect to move into the procurement process for this equipment, our goal would be to pick non-proprietary equipment that could be tied into, you know, regional fare payment, uh, fast track, clipper card, any kind of open payment, Apple Pay. Um, our goal would not, would be to not limit ourselves to a specific technology moving forward. That makes sense, but it sounds like we're gonna have to make a decision as we go through the stakeholder, the outreach process and so forth, we're gonna have to make a decision whether we're gonna have sort of short-term free parking or not, at least given current technology. Correct. Okay. So the only, only other thing I wanted to say is that every time the whole RPP thing comes up, the number of 85% comes up, and I keep saying that, folks, this is not the right number for a residential neighborhood, right? It's for downtown areas. And now we're talking about downtown areas and we're talking about 85%. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember um, Du Bois. So I think since the motion is basically to accept the report, I'm kind of treating this a little bit like a study session, just give some comments. Um, first of all, what governs sofa parking and how come we never talk about it? We, we like, it was interesting looking at the map, I had the downtown core and the RPP and then sofa is just a, a whole. So SOFA is outside of the University Avenue parking uh, permit fund district. Um, I think it's generally two hour parking uh, as most of our commercial areas are. Um, we could certainly take, you know, if, if you wanted us to look at expanding this to the SOFA strange. area, we it's could certainly look at that. It's not in the RPP either, right? Yeah, we could certainly look at that moving forward if you think that's a wise, a wise move. I, I think we need to, it's just kind of a hole there. Um, the other things, and I really think we're missing the retail impact assessment. And I heard what you said about looking at sales tax and looking for closures, but that's feels like we're looking in the rear window a little bit. So if there's any way to do an economic analysis to kind of think what we're gonna, what's gonna happen to retail, um, I think that'd be a much better way to do it. Um, I think we could look at Redwood City and some other case studies and see what occurred uh, yeah. after their implementation, but I don't know that we could predict do they have uh, the outcome of our, what was that? Do they have retail? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they do, they do, <laughs> a yeah. little bit, yes. I'd actually be really interested in Redwood City's experience because they, they rolled it out at like 25 cents an hour and then they upped the price once things were working. And so they might have some interesting data actually. Um, the other thing is we, and most of these parking studies we get, we say, well, you know, there's a lot of private parking, but that wasn't in the scope. And at some time, I think we really need to access private parking in downtown Palo Alto, what the opportunities are to use that space. You talk about it a little bit in your report, but we never do it. Um, so I really think we should get, get to it. Um, I too would like to see some free time. I mean, I'm particularly, I'm thinking along university. Um, and you talked about all these payment options. Maybe you can, you can pay and if you, you have to put in your credit card, but it charges you zero for that first 30 minutes or whatever. Um, I personally don't support the pay to stay. I think the analysis was right that um, people will just pay the retail rate and stay there all day long. And so having some fixed time pricing to protect retail, I think is pretty critical. Um, I do think we should even consider free time on weekends. I mean, I did look at your, I mean, weekend evenings definitely is full for the restaurants, but I think f considering free parking on Saturdays and Sundays um, during the days and, and sucking it up in the evenings might still make sense to bring people downtown. Um, and the, the other point I wanna make is I, I don't think we should predetermine that this revenue goes to the TMA. Um, I think it's really premature. There were a lot of comments tonight about that happening, but um, I think we got a lot of transportation projects. We have the city shuttle, 
Um, we have these payment systems. We have the wayfinding systems. I really think, you know, this revenue should go towards those things first. And, um, and even things like Lyft and Uber for seniors. I mean, other things we've talked about for um, the residents of Palo Alto. And I, I think we really need to continue the Citizens Advisory Committee on funding transportation projects. Um, and I really th see the TMA as something that should be funded more directly by the business community. And that's why I think we need that CAC to evaluate some kind of uh, business tax or other business funding mechanism. Um, and then hearing that the revenue may not, you know, you know, by the time this all happens, it's gonna be two or three years out. So I don't think we want the TMA necessarily waiting for the revenue from these parking systems. Um, I, you know, in terms of the new parking organization, uh, it was interesting to see the comparison between cities. Um, and I hope we can run it if some cities were quite large. I mean, it was shocking how many people they had in their, their parking operations. So the more we can automate and the more efficient we can be, I, I think the better um, in kind of minimizing those operational costs. And, and along the way, it was pretty interesting to read about the, um, like things like the sensors having a ongoing $10 per space kind of fee. And uh, it was mentioned that there's some new companies coming out with much lower costs. I think we should be really aggressive, not be conservative and go with these traditional providers. I don't wanna see us impose all these fees on people for parking it just goes to private companies to have the system perpetuate itself. Um, I personally, I favor the pay stations. I, I think San Mateo uses those downtown without individual meters. I, I think the individual meters are not attractive. Um, I was asking about the operational costs. It seems easier to kind of vandalize individual meters than pay stations, um, but uh, that's my preference. Um, and the other thing about comparison to the other cities, we didn't really get uh, some time to ask questions about this, but you had some stats in there that like 25 to 40% of people who buy permits in Palo Alto actively use that permit. I wondered how that compares to other cities. Are we unusual or is that pretty typical? Um, and also about 60% of the people said it was used at a park and is that typical? Are we doing okay or is that low? I didn't know if I should answer them one at a time. Um, I think that what we have found comparatively in the Bay Area, because of the price that the people are paying for permits, like in Berkeley, for example, they're actually using those permits because of the value of what they're paying for. And I think the comment that we made earlier was also feedback that we received from your stakeholders and from the um, intercept surveys, was that people, um, because your price of the permit is so low, that even if they just come downtown and park a couple of times a month, it's worthwhile for them because it's just easy to access. Um, I actually personally did a lot of the interviews on the street, and um, when we talked about how easy it was to park, it was often interesting to hear the person kind of sit there and debate, because at first it was like, yeah, it was so hard. Well, how long did it take you? Well, only a couple of minutes. And then, you know, so when they really started to think about it, the general standard is people don't want to walk more than a block or two. I mean, everybody wants to park right out in front of where they go. That's why we have the circulation and congestion issues. But in general, um, you have a very walkable downtown. I've walked every single block of your downtown while we were counting cars and collecting license plates. Um, and I think that that's something when you take the walkability aspect of Palo Alto, that should be a big part of the promotion of the wayfinding program. Um, we worked with a program before that also identified like the walking distance, you know, if you park, you know, at one particular garage, how long it would take you or the distance, you know, equitable. And now with everybody with their little fitness bracelets on and things, you can kind of tie all of that together. And I think that that could be a part of a really proactive education campaign to think about as well. And I just wanted to point out to councilmen, the issue of pay station versus single space. This is a debate in every community that we work in. And it really, that's why when we say that, you know, no decisions have been made, it really comes down to the community and the decision by the community because what works in one jurisdiction doesn't necessarily work for the other. The fact is the technology can all accept the smart payments, they can do the credit cards, pro program the dynamic rates, special events, all of the technology that we're proposing here can do it. It's whether you do a hybrid solution, some of this, some of that, 
San Mateo actually does have the traditional pay stations, but they do still have the old school coin operated single space. You just don't necessarily see them as prevalently because they're more in the outer lying areas. And so it's just the opportunity of where you put the equipment in to maximize on those yeah. for sure. So again, that 60% number saying it's easy to park, is that low or? I think it's pretty consistent, I'd say, with the statistics that we found from community to community, is that yeah. when you really start, you know, people, the, we talk about the perception of parking, and that's usually what it really is, is the perception. And when you really start to really drill in and talk to people and start to really talk brass tacks and they really start to think about it, that's when they start to kind of come back with the whole, maybe it's not as big of a deal, but when, you know, you're sitting in the coffee shop or, you know, gabbing in the morning with, you know, your neighbors, you know, it's always about it's so tough to park. But if you really think about it, the fact that the example of the people that can actually ride their bike versus walk, a lot of the folks that we interviewed on the street were residents that had walked to downtown and that they found that it was just a matter of convenience for them that they could drive and park, but they knew that they would just park on the outskirts. It was just easier to walk that day. Okay. Uh, one other thing, uh, when you asked about professions, it seemed like about 40% of them were services or other services it might be good to break that out and, and i noticed you didn't really ask about kind of high-tech companies yeah so 40 percent is a pretty big kind of bunch where we don't <laughs> really know what they do <laughs> um and then finally like i said it before i'd really like to see us apply this learning to cal Ave without going through this whole process over again i think again if there's a way when we put out the rfps for things like the website <laughs> or enforcement or selling permits if there's a way that it could be written where we could extend it at some point to include Calav, just to think about it at least, um, rather than again, starting from scratch. So, um, uh, you know, in terms of the motion, I, I, don't, I don't think we really needed to add A. I mean, my reading of the, of the report was that that is gonna be considered um, already, but um, I'm gonna support the motion. Just one point of clarification, council member. Um, the recommendation uh, for the, the period of, uh, of paid parking in the report is only Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay. Uh, there is a recommendation that we conduct enforcement on the weekends, but that would only be enforcing things like double parking, um, uh, illegal parking at fire hydrants, those All right. kind of Thanks things. Thanks for the clarification, I, I support that. <laughs> council member Coop. Actually, uh, Council Member Du Bois basically said everything I wanted to say. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Mayor Ness. So um, I was glad that Tom brought up the APGS issue. Could you say a little more about that? I have, I have been anxious for an APGS for ages, and I have had envy in other cities when I look up and they tell me exactly what floor I can park on and how many spots there are. So our APGS system, which uh, we brought to you last year and you recommended that we move forward with the single space LED system that mm -hmm. each space would have a, a color coded ago. LED. Mm -hmm. um, we have moved forward with that and we're in the final design phase. Um, it's in the CIP, the current five year CIP, but the funding for that is dependent on additional parking revenue. Um, so when we program that CIP, we assume that there would be additional parking revenue available. And that's actually one of the capital projects that we would recommend be funded uh, if we elected to move forward with paid parking. But, but Council Member Du Bois' question, I think, was how is it, does it, does it feather somebody else's nest instead of, instead of? No, that the, the parking fees should go to pay for things like wayfinding first. Right, yep. no, but I thought you indicated there were different types of systems that um, sometimes return more to the, yes. the yeah. owner. Yeah, exactly. So, so I want to be sure we get the system that is the most advantageous for us and the so, least expensive. So we would do our best uh, in the procurement process to avoid being locked into some type of proprietary <laughs> system that would require you know, an annual fee in perpetuity, and then we would have to replace if that company went out of business. That's not advantageous for the city. So, um, you know, we would do our best to avoid that type of technology and have something that can be adapted with different software and integrated into different uh, operating systems moving forward. So, because most of us have anecdotal evidence about other cities around us, um, Councilmember Walbach and I were in San Mateo recently 
um, and had most unfortunate experiences with parking. Um, it happened to be a, a rainy, rainy day, and we had meters that only took coins. If you're not used to having coins with you, it's uh, incredibly frustrating, so I would certainly hope that we have credit card machines. Um, I probably we will be all over the place on this. I prefer the ones that that are the the double headed ones that that you know can take two cars at once. Um, and the maintenance of the of the um, of the parking meters. How how do you what experience have you had with that? Because my experience in San Mateo was they they had some issues with maintenance. Sure, so I will highlight again, San Mateo has the single space coin operated meters and that the few that they have. So I actually used to manage the city of San Francisco's parking meter um, county and collections operation and we worked very closely with the city's parking meter maintenance program. And uh, there's over 25,000 single space meters. Um, I will say with the smart meter systems that do go in, and this is what I was trying to refer to the council member, is that um, it's actually fairly low maintenance. You would actually be surprised. There is a level of vandalism, don't get me wrong, but it actually is fairly insignificant compared to the overall inventory. I think some, there's a theory that just because they're shiny and silver and new that people are afraid there's little cameras in them, there's not. But um, <laughs> the fact is is that I think people are a little bit intimidated by the infrastructure. They still have a little bit of the stickers and you know people doing random things with them, but it's not that significant. The maintenance the, for the, both the multi-space and the single space, it's actually component based so that your maintenance staff or your outsourced maintenance staff can basically come in and just do swap and play. Uh, meaning that you literally can take the head off the mech and pop a new one in if it's significant or just pop it out and do whatever little maintenance you have to do. It's actually quite simple to maintain. Uh, your city staff can be trained by the vendors and support the systems. So currently the city of San Francisco, <coughs> I want to say for the 25,000 plus single space meters, they currently have a staff of I think about 25 parking meter repair technicians to support 25,000 meters. Um, so right now, in terms of a program of your size, we're talking about roughly maybe one to two potential staff-related type positions. But um, again, the warranty programs are very robust with both the pay station and single space meters. And um, the cities that I've worked with that have implemented the solutions really have had very minimal to low upkeep. They are green. Um, all of the equipment that we're proposing are, is solar powered. And so basically minor carbon footprint, all of those aspects as well. And everything that we're talking about here today takes credit card payments as well as the mobile payment solution and everything that we're talking <clears throat> about as easy as you can possibly make it. And again, the dynamic pricing models. Yeah, I, I appreciate hearing all that. And also I, I am supporting this, but the, the last para, the last line of the recommendation does say consideration. So we are, we are, this is not, this is not um, in cement yet. So we, we are really going to consider this. So I think in reality, we'll be bringing back different components uh, to the council because some are more ready to go forward than others. Um, so I, I think we will definitely, you know, make different decisions uh, as those come to you. <coughs> Councilmember Tanaka. Um, so yeah, I'm going to support this motion as well. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't have any amendments or anything to the motion, but I do just have a couple comments. Because I, I think in order to get buy-in with the community, I think having some portion of, of free parking uh, is going to be important, um, especially for retail. And so um, I have two, two ideas. Um, one is kind of a high-tech idea, and the other one's kind of a low-tech idea. So the high-tech idea is I've, I've actually seen some startups that actually use drones to fly and actually like monitor the license plates of all the cars. So that's, that's uh, one, one way to do it. Um, another way is um, kind of just using the traditional license plate readers on cars. And I, I, I understand the accuracy is maybe only 85% of you, you don't have a straight view of, of, of the license plate. But, um, and so that means that you know, the enforcement will not be perfect, right? Which, which is um, not necessarily ideal. But um, what we could do is just have a higher fee, so a higher penalty. So it's like, rather than just a $50 fee or $100 fee, it could be like $400. So if you're doing the parking shuffle, you're, you're deliberately moving your car 
every two hours, you get nailed once. That'll be the last time you do it, and that'll be, and, and the word would spread, right? That the, the well, we not we may not catch you most of the time, but the times we do catch you, you're dead, right? And and that would really prevent this kind of um, parking shuffle that happens. Council member, if I could take you with me to different municipalities and advocate for that, I'd really love that, but I don't know how well that would go over with the community, but I have to tell you, being able to increase the penalty. Well, <laughs> just two ideas to help try to make sure. something like this happen. Councilmember Holman. Um, thank you. So a couple of questions. Um, since we have, and I know this has been a long-standing issue with, with Vice Mayor Nist, so since we don't have the minutes that we used to have, we're making a lot of comments here that we're, you know, would think want to be forwarding to the Planning Commission um, and even the Finance Committee uh, as we get refreshed of this. How are those comments going to be forwarded? <clears throat> Anybody? I mean, we can forward the notes from this meeting uh, as part of the staff reports for both PTC and the Finance Committee. Okay, as you've taken notes for people's comments? Yes. Okay. Um, Don't can't... we do actual minutes? Well, I thought we did verbatim, verbatim minutes. Verbatim. We for the, do verbatim for, minutes. For the motion. We do verbatim minutes for the entire, for the entire meeting. Yes. We do I verbatim guess, I guess minutes. I read the motion minutes, so. Okay, all right. Um, so, um, as um, Councilmember Koo said, Councilmember Du Bois asked a lot of the questions that I had or made the, the suggestions or comments that I had a lot of. Um, I won't repeat any except for uh, just a couple. I think it's particularly important to find out from retailers how <clears throat> they anticipate this is going to affect them. I got an email today from a retailer who's nearby the parking garage, for instance, and they had significant concerns about <clears throat> doing uh, paid parking, especially while the parking garage was going to be built near their business. And it's like it's just like you know, they had real concerns about how it was going to impact their their uh, business. Um, so there are a couple of things along those lines. I think uh, bear uh, repeating and and um, pronouncing along with Councilmember Du Bois's comments. Um, if we don't do regular and um, frequent um, interview and analysis with retailers, you know, once they've closed or been impacted so badly that they can't survive, then it's, it's, it is, it's too late. And we're going to lose some of those businesses. So I don't know what your frequency rate is for wanting to poll and how broadly you're going to poll uh, retailers and personal service uh, businesses. We can. Uh you know, before we bring it back to you, we'll develop a plan on how we'll try to monitor that, uh, you know, in advance of them experiencing any hardship and try to get ahead of the, the curve. Okay. All right. Um, fully support comments that several have made about just want to, like, strengthen that. Um, the, having some free parking, I think, is essential. I mean, I can't imagine wanting to pay 250 to run into Mac's Smoke Shop to pick up a newspaper or, you know, run into New York pizza just to pick up your order. Um, I, just, I just can't imagine that that's, that's what people are going to be willing to do. Um, on uh, your slide 26, what, what are the uh, boundaries of tier three? It just runs off the... R runs off the... Uh, graphic, if you will, outside of tiers one and two. Tier three on the west side would be uh, south of Lytton and uh, east of Alma Street. Uh, and, then, so and then on the, uh, the east side, I need to find the color zone map here. Do the color zone map then? Oh, here we go. So on the east side, it would be uh, west of Webster and north of Forest. Okay, so you just didn't put dashed lines around those areas, but it's the areas. It, it would here. be the current extent of the <coughs> color zone area. Okay, all right. Um, also have a preference for the um, 
um, I've just lost the term here, for the, for the pay stations as opposed to individual meters, um, partly aesthetics, partly maintenance, partly, um, you know, we have enough, we have enough things going on already, just adding individual space meters just like really makes for a complicated complex and kind of littered uh, downtown, if you will. Um, in, in terms of looking at Redwood City, I, I don't know if Redwood City is really a comp. Um, it's a very different um, geography in terms of other shopping areas and towns than is Palo Alto. So I really don't know that it's a comp. Um, and looking at their experience with, with uh, uh, paid parking, because um, we have Menlo Park, Mountain View, Los Altos, and the Stanford Shopping Center. We have all of those like just right here. Um, so I just, I don't know what, what you're going to look at or what you're going to find that's really a comp for um, paid parking impacts on, uh, on another community as we're considering this. If you have any thoughts besides Redwood City, it'd be great to hear them. So in terms of uh, California cities that are implementing paid parking, the right now Napa is in the process of considering it as well. Um, but really, <clears throat> we're talking about non-California-based cities um, that probably have the most recent implementation of paid parking solutions. Um, really, we're talking about programs currently in California that have actually been established for you know, a pretty decent amount of time, if not a couple of years, if not longer. But we can definitely roll our sleeves up and look a little bit deeper just to make sure we're not missing one. But most of them have been established at least, you know, operating for a few years, if not more. Yeah, it's, just, it's important to look at, see that we do have, you know, really a comparable situation when you're looking at, at the impacts. Um, let me see if that covers all the... <clears throat> Oh yeah, one other place that I think is, is uh, perhaps sensitive to is, um, is to keep an eye on the Aquarius Theater um, because they have matinees in the afternoon if you have to pay you know, an extra two, 250 to go to a, let's see, is that one? Actually, that would be tier three, so that's not so bad. Yeah, that would be tier three, so not, not, not such a big deal. Um, I think that might be yeah, I think those are my those are my comments. Thanks. So, I've heard of a lot of council members raise some interest in having an hour or maybe possibly two hours of free parking. That's sort of what we have now. And so, one of the things I'm concerned about is the way the motion's written is that it doesn't clarify that we actually want more options. And I think it's and I'll suggest some wording changes, but what I'm really looking for you guys to do is to come back and think about this and say, do we want it? Do we want paid parking? And if so, this is what it was going to look like. And here are the benefits of paid parking in terms of, and the biggest one I think that we should discuss, and I, I guess if the bottom line came down to it, if paid parking made us a lot of money, then I think there may be a value to it. If it costs us money, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. And I'm not, I'm not convinced, frankly, that you know, we're going to make money on it. I'm concerned about the cost of the infrastructure, and I'm even more concerned about the cost of the personnel. So I, I don't want to be having all these pension and, you know, I mean, we have, what, 8 FTE right now? I mean, I would hate to see us have 30 FTE related to parking and then say that we're making money on it. So, I, I do think we want to be really thoughtful as we go through in this and ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish? And I haven't yet really connected the dots, and it's probably me, but I haven't connected the dots yet between why paid parking, and when we talk about paid parking, we already have paid parking in, in Palo Alto, in the downtown garages. And I believe we sell permits in our street lots too, we do. So we have paid parking in Palo Alto. What we don't have is paid hourly parking. And if you're not going to have, so right now you can park for two hours for free. And unless we're going to have, what do we call it, pay if you, can, if you stay longer, you can stay longer. What, what is the cute term we have for that now? Pay to stay. So if we don't have pay to stay, what are we getting 
that's different than what we have now. We're doing away with color zones, but why couldn't you just say, hey, you could park for, free, for two hours free in the downtown for two hours, period. Other than that, you basically have to buy a permit and you can buy, you know, maybe we could have technology buy three hours, four hours, I don't know. But what do we get that's different than that? I, I haven't really seen that. You know, if you're worried about turnover, why can't you say, and you see this all the time, why can't you say on University Avenue, it's a green space and you can park for 30 minutes and you know other places you can park for two hours. So if you want turnover, why can't you just say, and then if you want people not to switch within the downtown, why can't you just say it's one color zone anywhere you park in the downtown and then you could do it by number of. So I guess what I'm looking for is you also to come back with if we don't charge for parking, how would you put this together without charging for parking? So it sounds like you want us to return with various pricing structures that you can discuss. I do. When we return. I do. I, I you know, I, I don't want to lock, I mean, I've heard at least, and I didn't do counts in my head, but I heard at least three council members and possibly more say they want some free parking. And I heard you say the technology is not there really to do that. Forgive me, to the degree that the council member asked for to be able to provide free parking for a time limit on street and then to pay for it, um, it's going, the technology does not exist today to allow you to do that. Um, in the combination of using parking sensors as well as LPR, the systems are not accurate enough to be reliable to allow you to do that effectively today. But I think we can return uh, to you with various pricing structures, one of which includes a free period of parking, and we can look at the financial impacts of that um, on the greater cash flow plan. No, I think that would be really great. And the other thing I wanted to say about the whole parking choice thing is when this, what I'd really like us to do is to hone in on what we're trying to achieve and why this achieves it. And then one of the concerns I have is if we go to paid parking with no free parking anywhere, what are we gonna do about people who decide now that they're gonna park in the neighborhood for two hours for the RPP space and then move their car somewhere else? You know, or just move their self within the neighborhood. I mean, I could see what, and this gets back to your studies. So I had some concerns that your studies you know, you're meeting people on the street and you're interviewing them and you had like September, October, right? You got some very different answers. So I was concerned that statistics did not necessarily seem to be being applied to this and that it wasn't a statistically valid, valid study. And the conclusions drawn from non-statistically valid studies are not valid. And I also noticed that most of the people you interviewed, I think Councilmember Du Bois talked about this, was a lot of them seemed to be in the retail, maybe 60%. And if you looked at their salary ranges, I thought the salary ranges that people reported were fascinating. In some of those, a huge majority of people said they make you know, no more than like $75,000 a year. But other words in the conclusions of the report are that, hey, Palo Alto is an affluent community, so people won't care. Those people you interviewed cared deeply, and they were, adamantly opposed to paid parking at the same time. And I, I was trying to square that to somewhat, and to me that struck me that what we really need to do is to get those people low-income um, garage permits. We started to do some of that in the neighborhoods, but we need to have low-income garage permits. And then there were some places in the study where we talked about how we need to raise the price of the garages because they're so underpriced, and yet at the same time, we need to have those low income ones, that was clear to me. But I would, and while we're raising the prices, we need to make sure though that everyone goes into the garages so they have to be lower than the prices that we're charging on the street if we're allowing people to stay all day. And, and I realize that's why we're going back to the Planning and Transportation Commission, the Finance Committee, and that. But it seemed that there were a lot of contradictions, or at least they weren't spelled out clearly for me to simply connect the dots in a vast amount of material. And that made me somewhat, somewhat concerned. Um, 
So I guess I did want to just basically ask, why couldn't you just get rid of the color zones and have one zone? Why would that be different than having parking meters? If revenue was not an issue. So before we um, answer that, I just a uh, couple points of clarification. The intercept survey is not purported to be a scientific survey. It was an intercept survey of people walking uh, down the street that were semi self-selected, uh, also selected by the consultant. Um, I think there are some important takeaways, but I wouldn't read that as a scientific survey. Um, the occupancy studies that were done were a scientific you know, documentation of how long people are staying, right. what the occupancy rates are. Um, and then in regard to the permit pricing in the garages, um, I, I admit it is a little hard to, to, you know, we're talking about very different um, constituencies. We're talking about hourly parkers, daily parkers, and then monthly permit holders. And uh, the study does recommend increasing the monthly permit price in the garage, uh, but at the same time offering a low income permit for the garages because right now we're basically incentivizing low income applicants to, to buy RPP permits because that's the only low income option that we have. Um, the daily parkers, um, daily parking and hourly parking should be less expensive in the garage because we don't want daily parkers to occupy on street spaces all day. So that's the discussion around making sure that the hourly and the daily parkers are incentivized to, to move to the garages if it makes sense to them. So there is, there's kind of three different discussions occurring with about three different constituents. And I worry that we conflate them. It, it struck yeah. me that a lot of these things we could do to make life better right now. And I'm worried that I don't want, I don't want, for instance, I'll, I'll give you a simple example. It's clear to me that if we sold a low income, you know, permit or a moderate income permit or however we want to call it, where you could buy it, you could pay it monthly. And what, what are we charging right now for our, our moderate or low income? Uh, the it's low like income RPP permits are $100 a year. Right, so it's 100 bucks a year. That's less than $10 a month, right? So I could see if I started a retail job and you asked me to shell out 100 bucks, I'm gonna say no. If you asked me if I wanted to pay nine bucks or whatever it is mm -hmm. to be able to not move my car between zones and do that, I think most people would say yes. In fact, most employers would be, yeah, I can come up with the nine bucks. But I don't want to wait for us to implement that while we go through this long process. And so I wanted you to address, do I need to put that in the motion or are you going to come back to us? And no. in fact, are these things that you already have the authority to do? And so, you're going to go out and do them and so, get so, it done. So some of the recommendations in the study we're already advancing. Um, mm -hmm. We're already moving forward with uh, assembling an RFP for a new comprehensive permit system. Um, right now, we still sell, you know, people have to come into the, uh, the front uh, desk on the ground floor to buy daily permits uh, for the garages and lots. There's two very outdated machines at two of our garages where people can also purchase permits, but they break about every two weeks and we have to go out there personally and you know, add paper to them and refill them. Um, people on Cal Ave have to come to downtown to buy a daily permit for the Cal Ave lots and garages. So our goal is to roll out a new comprehensive permit system that will enable us to bring all of our permit sales under one system. It will be seamless online. We'll be able to sell monthly low income permits, quarterly permits. Um, people won't have to come all the way downtown. They'll be able to use their smartphone, ideally, if we you know, also implement uh, license plate enforcement. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can move forward with. Um, the paid parking aspect is, is not uh, holding up other things that we, we are moving forward so with. So then I get to my, my last concern, then it was something that Jim said, actually. It made me very concerned and something you did, which is that, well, you said that it's going to take two to three years if we imp once we implement paid parking for us to be profitable on this, but that the funding for, I forget the term for it, but was it the AGS, which is the signs, yeah. <laughs> was going to be paid out of that paid parking. That puts it five years away. That's not acceptable. And, you know, we talk about you just gave us a bunch of great things we're going to do. But I'm concerned that I think we have to get away from this notion that we're going to pay for that out of revenues of paid parking. Because even if we get the paid parking in, I don't think we should wait five years to get that stuff done. And I mean, if council wants to do that, that should be a choice. But right now, you just told us all these great things you're going to do in terms of the monthly parking and the stuff. But those are going to cost money to do that. 
and you haven't, you sort of indicated you're out doing them, but do you have a budget? I mean, are you planning on doing this in the next six months, or is this a five-year plan where five years from now it's going to be great? And that's, that's a decision that council needs to make, you know, as a, as a clear decision that they make choices. So I, I thought you could address that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, there's, there are so many things, uh, so many components to the, this, and it's, it's interactive, but what I've heard so far tonight is that, in, in one sense, the biggest sort of question mark really is around the on-street paid parking. Everything from do we do it, how do we price it, what kind of technology do we deploy? Um, the need for maximizing the use of our parking garages by all ultimately increasing what it costs so that people, one, don't waste it and just misuse it, to getting the parking guidance systems to um, hopefully a little bit more understanding for why wayfinding may be an important component. Um, you know, I'd like to sort of feel that those are things that can proceed on a faster track, even than the decisions on uh, uh, paid parking. And um, in order to do this, we're going to have to say that's what we want to do, and then we're going to have to advance money, in my view, somehow from the general fund, whether we commit some from reserve with this idea that we'll have revenue streams from the enhanced price of paid parking in the garages, we'll have to cost out what that would look like and mean. And I, I'm probably way outside of my element here, but even if the council wanted to test some of these things in advance by us really raising the paid parking fees and we really see, in the parking garage fees, we really see whether we sell permits as long as there is free on street parking, we could look at that and not feel we've got to do everything simultaneously. I'm, I'm in the camp that would say once we really price the parking where it should be in the garages, we will see people who will want to try to park much more on the street just because, you know, but we may have to do that interactively. But we are going to have to advance ourselves some money. Uh, you, know, e you know, we can't wait five years, for example, and the truth we've got to, We've got to be able to advance and start implementing these systems as they go on. The second thing I just would say is is, is that um, while it's while the, all these moving pieces make it sort of say, well, geez, how do we really know what we want to do, or how do we want to adjust, or how dynamic is? I think we should take some comfort in that we're already in that situation. I mean, we're already in a situation where we clearly don't have the garages price right. We don't even know why we are not getting enough uptake. We just tried to fix the, the bleed over in the neighborhoods with RPP. A really good question was raised is we actually don't know how many people don't even bother to come into downtown Palo Alto because the parking actually seems to be a problem. So we're already dealing with the fact that there are all these moving pieces and we don't quite know what to do. So I don't think that it's like everything's perfect now and now we're going to try to run all these experiments. We're running experiments right now, some of which are already telling us clearly we've got to change our ways. So I think we should get more comfortable with just being able to incrementally move along. We are just trying to bring the council up to speed and then we're talking about going through these processes with the PTC and finance while we're concurrently pushing these things with the staff. And I think we'll keep you informed all the way. But, you know, right now the biggest thing that seems to be the hang up, right, is how fast we're going to proceed on the on-street paid parking piece. And if we could kind of walk away feeling most of everything else we've talked about clearly were, were there, that would really help us know how we could put together both the timeline and the funding needed to be sure we're advancing that, and then we could also deal could with the other Could you just repeat piece. that? What you just <laughs> I heard you say is that you want to know that we're there on everything else but the paid part, on-street paid part. Yeah, I mean, that's just what I'm just sort of and trying. I'm totally with you on that. Okay. I, I feel that way. I don't know how everyone else Good, feels. No, that's right. But I'm not sure the motion captures that, to be honest. Um, sure, since I blew it up, why not? <laughs> So I just wanted to say I agreed with a lot of your comments. Uh, 
particularly on the staffing costs versus revenue. And so, you know, when I look at the motion, I see, you know, a request for a finance plan. And so when we say we're in agreement with everything except front street parking, I don't think I'm quite there. I, I think I'm more with what I heard with the mayor was, which was um, kind of want to see how the financing plays out. I mean, reading the report, it looked like it could be a substantial amount of revenue that could pay for a lot of impacts. Um, but maybe people aren't entirely clear on that. So seeing, seeing that finance plan um, with the whole integrated system, I think would provide a lot of clarity. So I think that's what the motion says. The report was really long. Uh, and there was a lot of good info there about substantial increases, um, tiered parking. I mean, a lot of it made sense, but it was a lot to digest. So well, the way I'm interpreting this motion is, uh, you know, I kind of support what's in that report. You're gonna refine it and come back. And I think being really clear on the finance piece will be really helpful when you do come back. So, so I think we could bring back a financing plan with, a, you know, a free period. We could bring back a financing plan with no paid on-street parking. And then we could bring back one that has the recommendations, you know, for paid yeah. parking from the report. So to interrupt Council Member yeah. Boys, which is probably unfortunate, but I just wanted to clarify, if we leave the motion that way, because I was going to wordsmith it to basically tell you to do that, to come back with options. And I, I, I heard, I don't know if you were, do, I, I just wanted to make sure, because I don't read the motion that way. And what really happens is, you know, the next time we look at this is a year later. And, and we forget it. And we forget it. So I'm open to suggestions that you would have, frankly, to make those changes. And, I, if, but, and I'll, I'll finish with Councilmember Du Bois, but that's really what I wanted to, to get to. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify my thoughts on free parking, because I'm actually fairly comfortable with paid on street parking. Um, just to make sure Josh hears this. So my thought on free parking was, again, if it's possible using the technology, I was personally just looking really at University Avenue itself and a, having like 30 or 60 minutes of free parking right in the core retail area. Um, but a lot of what's free today would become paid. So that is a difference. It wasn't free everywhere for two hours. So that's the way I was thinking about it. I don't know, other people were talking about one or two hours free. Um, but so I just wanted to clarify. I was mostly on board with the report. Can I just, Mr. Mayor, I mean, I think the motion actually does direct us. Um, one suggestion that, that, um, that Josh made to me in the first paragraph and the second to the last sentence where we are saying and return, okay, so we're going to, to refine recommendations related to the introduction of paid parking in downtown Palo Alto and to return, no, not with anything yet, yeah, with various phasing finance and implementation plans. Not that it's just one single one. And, 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 you know, and what I was saying when I said, I, I think you're mostly there on these things except for the on-street paid parking, that doesn't mean in every detail, but that seems like the area where there's the most one variability and two, if we were to try to get a, re a cl clarification from you guys tonight, we could not get that. There's a lot more, there's a lot more what ifs. And so I'd like us to be able to try to nail down some of these other components. We still have to be, we're gonna be coming back to finance to talk about this and they can ultimately spit that out to the council. So you're not, it's not a year from now where you see and hear this again. I don't think we wanna do that. We wanna be moving along and we've gotta make sure we have your okay. We want to put it in some manageable pieces. And then I think our biggest challenge is going to be, okay, how do we communicate how these different things relate to the on-street paid parking? Where do we do it? What's the pricing and those things? Okay, so Josh also suggests then that just above the line where we've put the insert, he says rather than saying paid parking itself, just various parking management strategies. Okay. Yeah, I think those are both okay. I mean, we're referring to the report you've just given us. So. Which obviously includes paid parking, but the, the fact. Right. I think that's good. Okay. I, I think we're good. We, we're not going to wait a year to come back to you guys, promise. 
And if you do have things that you can come back to us in piecemeal, it's a lot easier for us to digest them when they're not. All right, Council Member Wallach, you still want to speak? I just want, actually want a clarification because uh, there's been a lot of stuff that's been raised since the last time I, I waited. I don't want to take a lot of time, but um, I just want to make sure I'm really crystal clear on this. Is it your understanding that there is not technology available now so that I could park in a space with a meter that takes a credit card, I put in my credit card, and it charges me only after, it, it says first hour free, but put in your credit card because you're going to be here for three hours and we'll charge you for hours two and three. So I think with a credit card that may be doable, but the California vehicle code also requires that we accept cash. Okay. Um, so you'd have to refund, you'd have to have a way to refund a cash well, deposit actually, if you, you were. You could do it the same way where you say, I'm going to be here for three hours and it says the first hour is free. And so put in the coins for the first, for, for hours two and three. I think that's doable as well as to have so a, I think that's what if you're trying. buying multiple hours, you right. could have a reduced. Right. I think that's what a lot of us were getting at. So if I could just give an example, um, there are cities that have, and I don't even want to put this idea out there, but I want to tell you about the abuse of this. It's called a 20 minute free button. And um, some of the technology provides this 20 minute free button to address exactly what you're talking about. Because the intent was we're providing a courtesy 20 minutes and then you pay for your parking and everything happens from there. And what happens is, is that people park in that space and come out and press the 20 minute button every 19 minutes basically. So that what's happened now is we have a jurisdiction, I won't identify it, they're losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in parking revenue because of that. Now, what that says is that's where you need the enforcement. Uh, so, but the enforcement, <laughs> right? but then, so now there's other technologies that come into play. So now, when you talk about the amount of personnel required to manage that, and if you're talking about a location like your downtown, where let's just say there's a thousand parking spaces, how many parking enforcement officers do you need, even with LPR, to manage something like that? Okay, and it, uh, I guess I'll just say that uh, my last thing on this for now is, you know, one thing I'm certainly open to when you bring back options is University Avenue and the, the side streets immediately adjacent to it, maybe what you have listed is zone one, be free, but with a time limit of, say, 30 minutes or one hour. So you want to do your quick errand to the core of downtown, you can run in, it's free, you park, you grab your coffee, you go back out, and if you decide, hey, I want to stick around downtown longer, you move it somewhere else where you can pay for longer. So just, you know, something else that I'd be open to as a, as a potential option. Council member, one of the items that we talked about in the stakeholder meeting is actually the opposite of that, is that you actually charge on university and your core area where you have your density and potentially have your time zones surrounding that because that's where your draw is and so you put your paid parking potentially there and then you do your surrounding. That was discussed at length with the stakeholders as well. Um, again, that could be one of the items that we bring back in terms of a option for consideration but to your point, I hear where you're going but you actually, I would suggest you invert that. Which is why I'm glad we're not making final decisions tonight. I look forward to seeing what the PTC comes up with. Thank you. All right, Council Member Phil Seth, and we need to wrap this up. One hour free with credit card only. Council Member Fine. So I would just encourage staff, I haven't spoken on this yet, um, to take these comments pretty seriously. I think there is an issue about this one hour free. I would suggest to my colleagues, it's not that we actually want a one hour free for our residents, right, whether they're parking three hours. It's that we're trying to provide convenient parking spaces for folks doing short retail trips to our local businesses. I don't think it's actually that we're trying to give away the first hour free because that actually ruins the whole incentive system, right? So the second part of this is I would encourage us to keep all technological flexibility as possibilities. You say, you know, right now the LPRs are 85% and the sensors are needed for some of that. Um, but we should make sure we have the maximum flexibility in the future. So if there's some new vendor that comes along and figures out some way that we give away this first 30 minutes free in front of businesses we like, it happens. I just want to clarify, I wanted, I said the LPRs were about 95%. I just didn't want to go on record so that the vendors came after me and said I defamed them. So 95%-ish, thanks. All right, um, if we could vote on the board. And that passes unanimously. And I'm happy to report Councilmember Koo, whose light, who's no light wasn't working tonight, didn't have to use it once. <laughs>
public speaker so, commentator t commentators tonight were especially helpful. We do on have one more discussion. item. I'll make a motion. Uh, I, I'm fine with that. Uh, I'll move the item 12, the and staff I'll motion. <laughs> okay, I see no, um, no lights. So unless you have to speak to your motion, then which, can we vote on the board? And that passes unanimously. And then any council member questions or comments? I see none. Oh, council, oh, I see some now. Council member Holman. Um, just one, I was wondering if um, city staff could, um, I guess they have commented back, but city staff could um, give further consideration to extending the Castilea scoping comments period. Um, consistent with the comments of the speaker this evening. Okay, council member. I'll discuss that with the staff. We've been communicating back. Okay, didn't mean to cut you off. Council member Walbach, did you have something to say? I, judging by the unanimity of our votes this evening, uh, maybe we should have a uh, retreat every weekend. I am, <laughs> of course, just kidding. Uh, but I uh, did want to say thank you to the mayor, city manager. Uh, and our uh, uh, guest coaches who uh, helped lead us through what I thought was a very productive uh, retreat on Friday and Saturday. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>